This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And we're on. And today's guest, we've got Tommy Robinson. Tommy boy, how are we? I'm good, James. Man. How good are you? to see you, bro. Can I start off with a disclaimer? Because I read the comments of my last yes. ones. I'm not high on cocaine, okay? <laughs> it's me, it I'm is. not high on cocaine. <laughs> I read the comments, it's like, oh, he sniffed off his head. It's like, no, if I sniffed off my head, I'd be under that table, right? I wouldn't be sitting here doing the podcast. <laughs> so let's just get the record straight, okay? I'm not high on cocaine. <laughs> how have you been? I'm all right, mate. Up and down. You've kind of went global now. It's not just the UK. You've been on Jordan Peterson. Mm. Trump, Musk is sharing your stuff, like a lot of high-profile names. You've you've went global. The stuff that you're doing, the stuff that you're trying to do. Also, we'll touch on the UK rights. You're getting the blame for a lot. Um, we're over in Spain just now, but how are you? Um, I, for, for my cause, if we talk about the cause first, yes. we're in the best place we've been. How so? The largest audience we've ever had. Um, thanks to Elon Musk, not just the largest audience, but we've been proven right in everything. Unfortunately, the state, the country has got that in that bad of a state in most towns and cities, people are seeing the things that I'd warned about a decade ago. And they're now realizing it's happening. Um, the state of the country, people are fearful. They're scared. The British public are scared of what's happening to their country. People now feel and see this invasion, which is exactly what it is, is, is all can organize and orchestrated. It's population replacement. There's a plan to replace the European populations. And that's what we're witnessing. So if anyone doesn't think our Royal Navy could stop these boats coming into our country, is brain dead. They're not just stop- stopping them. They're literally picking them up and bringing them in. Government-funded NGOs are planning it from start to finish. The whole invasion of Europe is planned. It's orchestrated. The Tory party hand over the baton to the Labour party. They both have their both globalist agendas. They, they are working totally against the interests of the British people. And people can see it. They don't really know what's going on, but they feel it. They feel the country's going in the wrong direction. They know, especially with Keir Starmer, since he's got in power, that they're working against the interests of the British population. Touch on your book. You've got a new release. It's Amazon number one. Straight to number one. Knock Boris Johnson off the top spot, which is very satisfying for me because I get labelled as a hooligan, a thug. This is my fourth best-selling book. Yeah. And I'm a documentary maker. I've made eight documentaries that in their own, in their own right, would be award-winning documentaries if I wasn't a working-class kid from Luton Town. If I was part of the 1%, what this book is, this book details with evidence, this is an academic piece of work that's took five years in the making, where everything, we are being farmed like animals. Anyone who's read George Orwell's book, Animal Farm, it, t- it talks about that, and it's basically what they're doing to us. They treat us like farm anim- animals, they lie to us, they deceive us, Literally everything's a lie. We go through their lies. We prove them lies. In the back of the book is all the footnotes of evidence. So everything we say in here, we show you. They, 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 when I say they, the 1%, the oligarchy, rely on the fact that we are consumed with football, with music, with our own lives, with work, that we're not looking at their plans and what they're doing. And they're quite open about it. 
There's a 177-page document documentation by the United Nations about population replacement. Everything that's happening is happening. Now, do we want to become a minority? Is it right that we, as white Englishmen or white Scottish men, become a minority in our own country? No, it's not. So we had, and we, and what we look at in here is the numbers. By 2041, we're a minority. So we're running out of time. We run out of time to solve this. We look through the money bubble, the continuous just printing of money, the reason for mass immigration, how it's planned, how they destroy and attack anyone who gets in their way of their agenda. They have a massive agenda that's been planned for hundreds of years and they're playing it out. And we're literally, anyone who gets in the way, like myself, they come for you. And then they, they elevate certain people who are part of the oligarchy. And most people, what, what, what I've come to realise is, say like most feminists, feminists in the UK, where the fuck were you? when a generation of girls were getting raped. How, where are you now on that issue? How come none of you have spoke about it? They don't, I don't believe many of them even care, care about the cause that they put themselves in for. They care about climbing the ladder of the oligarchy, each one of them. So that's, that's why there's been mass silence. We look at, um, it goes through everything. It goes from start to finish about, it's basically an instruction manual. If you wanna know how the world works, the truth of how it works and what they're doing, it's laid bare in this book. I'm very happy it went to number one. Um, it, I think in the seven day period, that's going to have gone to number one. I'm going to hold the biggest demonstration of British patriots the country's seen on the 26th of October. And then I'm going to be sent to prison on the 28th of October, some week, eh? Everybody's minds are full of static, full of noise. We talk, You touched on there, football, music. There's all frequencies. But it, again, you know the old saying, freedom, bread and water, and it keeps them entertained where they don't really ask who the real enemy is. Like, how how does people disconnect though so they can then make a stand and, and open their eyes to then seeing the world like you say, we're all treated as cattle. It's dumbed them down, the schooling system, dumbed them down, everything learned from... Even if we talk about feminists who wanted to work in and then get jobs and then vote. What happens is John Rockefeller, he put them through, he started the schooling system where you've got the schooling system, was in place, but then what happens is women could vote and then women could get jobs. What happens when women get jobs? First of all, they're paying tax, just like they're double men. The tax, double right? the tax. So, and, and, then what, yeah, and then what happens is your, your missus is away to work. What happens? Where's your kids going to go? They then get into the schooling system where they're programmed and taught what they how to think, how to feel, and then it becomes a mass disconnect. But now we're all growing up. I always feel as if they're a hundred years ahead, anyway. But to wake into it and try and open up and quieten the mind down to look at the bigger picture and ask those questions: What the fuck is going on? How does people then disconnect from it, from the the patterns and the, the lifestyle? Because I still watch the football, but I know it really doesn't really it doesn't serve a purpose to me. There's some people's lives only. Or who plays up front for the football team or who's injured or that's who they're they, signing they want. yeah but how do we disconnect from because it's all we see and I still look for the, the football scores I still want to know what's going on in the Champions League the World Cups the Euros it's just consistent so how does people disconnect from it yeah I still love Luton Town yeah <laughs> I'm not saying you can't love your football what I'm saying is that most people are consumed by it that they rely on the fact that no one's looking at what they're up to and what they're planning and what they're up to and what they're planning is directly going to affect you and it's going to di directly affect your children. It's going to directly affect your wealth, your stability, your safety. Everything is in danger here. And I think most people quite like living in their bubble. Would my life have been better if I just stayed in my bubble and didn't open my eyes? Maybe. Maybe people realise something is happening but don't want to open their eyes. I'd say once your eyes are open to what's going on, it's impossible to close them. It's impossible to close them if you have a family. And most of the people who orchestrate these things, even I remember to listening to Theresa May, no kids. Angela Merkel, no kids. All of these people are, were pushing this agenda. Well, you've got no kids. So I just listened to Bill Mayer. Bill Mayer sitting talking about how diversity is great that whites are becoming a minority in Great Britain, especially in London. How brilliant it is. Yeah, what's brilliant? Mass crime, mass rape, terrorism. What's brilliant? The fact you can get a Chinese or a different food. Is that what you're saying is brilliant? Because diversity and, and the forced diversity that you're pushing on this nation in astronomical numbers that are now seeing white English natives become minority in the majority of towns and cities. That's the future. The future for our country, unless they stop the immigration. And I listen to Nigel Farage. He says he doesn't care about the demographic replacement of people. Well, we do. The British public do. So you're, you're, you're meant to be the representative of the British public who are voiceless. 48% of the British public did not vote. Keir Starmer got 9 million votes. 9 million votes is the population of London. 38 million people didn't vote. He has not got a mandate. You do not have a mandate for this country to enforce what the tyranny that he's enforced since he got elected. And the reason being that 48% of us didn't vote because we're disillusioned, disaffected. We don't trust them. They're corrupt. And then when we get new voices to 
to come and be the alternative voice, which I thought Reform Party were going to be, he stands and says, mass deportations are not a possibility. Why not? They entered our country illegally. Mass deportations are needed. Every one of them that broke into this nation, that have come through 16 safe countries, rapists, killers, and murderers, criminals, thieves, people whose ideology goes totally against our, our nation's beliefs and our culture, shouldn't be here. This is, we need to start saying it openly as it is. They shouldn't be here. They've overstayed their welcome in many towns and cities. They've pushed it to a point now. Our women are not safe. Do you know, James, I, I'm, I've, I've, I've been away. So on the 27th of July, we held our massive rally, 100,000 people, totally peaceful. That would have really upset the establishment. It was a celebration of British identity. When I say a celebration of British identity, that's everyone who's come to Britain and wants to be part of Britain. So we had a, had a fabulous day with music. We had a great event. The next day, I went to leave the UK. I was detained under the Terrorism Act. Then this is where people should be really scared, okay? Because I'm detained, and their words were under Article 7 of the Terrorism Act. This is at Folkestone Port. Um, we, we believe that you could be considered in the preparation or acts of terrorism. And then they say, we know you're not, but we have the rights now to question you for six hours. You do not have a right to remain silent. So what do you mean I don't have a right to remain silent? If you do not answer any of the questions truthfully that we're asking you, you breach the Terrorism Act. And then they take my phone. Now give us your PIN code for your phone. You, I say, I'm not giving you a PIN code for my phone. We well, do not have a right not to give you a PIN code for my phone. It's a total infringement. I'm a journalist, whether people like it or not. I know people find it hard. Yeah, I'm the most watched journalist in Great Britain. Okay, my documentaries. I've, I've produced more documentaries than any documentary maker in the last in the last three years in Great Britain. I'm probably the most renowned and recognised uh, documentary maker now in Great Britain. My latest documentary is on 52 million views, but they still want to say you're not a journalist. Well, why not? Because I tell the truth. Because I don't toe the line. Because I give an alternative viewpoint. So I was detained under the Terrorism Act and questioned for six hours about my lawful legal doings. Who are you working with? Who helps you do this? Do you know what their words were in the under this terrorism invest interview? What, how do you plan to stop the great replacement? It's like, is, are you for real? You really are. And they're going through, uh, they went on about Israel, the Israel and Palestine conflict. And I sat there for six hours being grilled. Then they got into my, they've got into my phone because they'd seized my phone. I refused to give them the pin code. So I was then arrested. Then I was detained and taken to a police station. And the reason I refused, which I told them, I'm not giving you the pin code to my phone because I don't trust you. I'm a journalist and my sources of information are protected. For example, I've done a five-part series called The Rape of Britain. I'm working on, we're working on epi episode six, but so many things keep getting in the way. In episode six, we have covert recordings that make allegations against a lead Labour politician for being involved in child mo molestation in, in a certain city that we were looking at. Yeah? We have the recordings. We've given them to the police. Now, I know they, they question me about that in the interview. So I think you want to know who my sources are. That's what I believe. And in every single city, so if we look in, if we look in Rochdale, if we look in Rotherham, if we look in Telford, if we look in all the cities that had the grooming scandals, we know that there were corrupt police officers. They got rid of evidence. They deleted things. Girls went in with DNA, knickers, where they'd been raped by Pakistani Muslim men, and then the, the knickers were lost. The DNA was lost. So I said, I don't trust you. And when I speak to someone who gives me information as a journalist, I, that's protected. I'm never going to give you it. So I refuse to give them my PIN code. I have to answer bail for that on the 25th when I return to the UK for terrorism. I'm probably going to be charged under the Terrorism Act, which is insane. And it, when, when all this is going on, again, I'm going to have a vent against Nigel Farage. He sits there and says, well, he wasn't. He was detained for something to do with his passport. No, I wasn't. I've got, I, I share, if he would have took two minutes research, I shared the paperwork. I was detained under the Terrorism Act for no crime. Yeah, I haven't committed no crime. They've took my phone. They're going through my phone because I then got a, my solicitors received a email where they've gone to a judge for access into the phone to let us know that they're accessing the phone and they wanted keywords to separate my journalism. I said, it's my work phone. Everything in there is to do with my work. You know, I'm putting together a documentary, but that was when I left the UK. So I left and I haven't been back since, since 27th of July. And that is when all the riots kicked off. What happened with Nigel Farage? Because I know you were a big supporter of him. You were sh sharing reform. You'd put all your supporters mm. onto him. What happened? Because then he went online and says he had no connection with you or some shit like that. Well, no, it's worse than that. I wouldn't mind if he had no connection. I, I, don't, I don't ask Nigel Farage to support me at all. What I want him to do is stop lying about me. What did stop, stop kicking us when we're down. Stop, stop tarring us as far right. Nigel Farage is, is, has been tarred as far right. He's been tarred as a racist. So he knows what it's like when you're falsely accused of saying and then he goes and kicks the boot and does the same to us. But not just to us. 
to anyone in his party that speaks up for us. They're removed from seats. They're told that they can't stand in election seats if they speak publicly about Tommy Robinson. Where, where's your issue on freedom of speech? He has a policy where the IRA, ex-members of the IRA can join reform, yeah? Ex-Islamic terrorists can join reform. If you've been associated with the English Defence League, you can't. Really, Nigel? What, what, what was wrong with what the English Defence League said, said then? Because the English Defence League were tired and attacked the entire time I led it. The entire time I led it, the, the Metropolitan Police Force have a national extremism unit that brands organisations like the BNP, like um, different groups. The entire time I led the English Defence League, it was branded by the police experts as a centrist organisation. It was never a far-right organisation. It had a Jewish division, a lesbian and gay division, a Sikh division, a Hindu division. Does it sound very far-right? It's not far right and it wasn't far right because the media continually told the public it's like they just lie and lie and lie and then it becomes a matter of fact. And then I don't, ex I, d I just don't, ex wouldn't have expected Nigel after the attacks he's been under to do exactly the same, T to take, to tow the establishment line. And I've, I I've, in the, in the upcoming, in the last election, I don't, didn't want to be accused of dividing the vote. Yeah. People saw reform as the best option there was. So I told people, yeah, that, that they, are, they still are the best option there is. So, but every populist party in Europe, so Gert Wilders has got to power. He stood, on, he stood and said he would ban the Quran. He stood and said he would have mass deportations. He didn't tow a politically correct line. The Austrian leader that just got elected and won the election two weeks ago said mass deportations are coming. Remigration. You're going back. Yeah. You're not welcome here anymore. Many of you. Okay, I'm not saying everyone, I'm not saying everyone, but criminals, people who are on the terror watch list, we have 40,000 on the terror watch list, they've got to go, get rid of them, they've got dual nationality, they've got, they're from Pakistan, we can't even get rid of the men that have groomed and raped, the Rochdale, the Rochdale rapists who were told they would be deported, none of them have been deported, they was, they're bumping into the victims in Asda, it's a joke, Ev, Salvini got into it, won the Italian, won the Italian elections, Le Pen, none of them have been, fear, all of them have been fearless, Nigel, I think, doesn't shift the Overton window at all. He waits for the Overton window to shift by people like us or activists like us, and then he joins the man wagon. And it pisses me off, if I'm honest, because I sit and think, you kick us when they're down. I, I, I currently am about to return to the UK. I face four years in prison. I made a film that has 52 million views that exposes corruption in the judiciary, the lying of the media. And how many British journalists and MPs ha have spoke about it? None. The first one yesterday, Alex Phillips. First journalist to contact me about that film was yesterday. It's on 52 million views and I faced four years in prison for it. Were you actually thinking you were getting somewhere this year? Because every demo got bigger, it got stronger. You had millions on the live. You had hundreds of thousands on the streets. And then straight after the last demo, all the UK riots started. Yeah. And obviously you're getting the blame for all that. You're at the forefront of instigating it all. Well, but this is a, it which winds me up again. So, Nigel... Again, I'm just, I'm just, I've got to have it because I'm annoyed, yeah? Nigel shared a post that said it was a Syrian illegal immigrant. Yeah? I didn't. I didn't share any post that said that the attacker was Muslim or Syrian or a refugee. I don't share anything until I know it's right. In fact, in my, in my group for my social media, I have fact checkers. So every, every news story I see before I post, I put into a social media group and it's their job to check and find the facts before it's put onto my social media. So Nigel shared some bullshit, so he was accused of instigating the riots. Then when he's getting interviewed about the bullshit that he shared, he said, well, well you want to act like I'm some sort of Tommy Robinson? No, Nigel, you're not some sort of Tommy Robinson, because I check my shit, yeah? I'm a, I'm a journalist and a thorough investigative journalist who checks my content before I put it out, whereas Nigel did. So I got blamed for the riots when, I, when all I called for was calm the whole time. Every video I made, do you know why? I understand the anger. I understand why those people are angry. When I was 25 years old, when I started the English Defence League, we put balaclavas on. We were angry. Yeah? So, but we had no voice. We had no outlet. No one was talking for us. No one would listen to us. We were totally neglected, totally forgot. White working class are the biggest ac academic underachievers yeah? in the country. It's not blacks. It's not my minorities. It's the white working class, the forgotten community of this country who have been beaten down, trodden down, alienated, absolutely obliterated as a community like we don't belong like, like we don't have a belonging we don't have a belief we don't have a culture we don't have a history we don't have an identity they've attacked us at every level so i understand the anger that's in the country and when people began writing i was the first person i made a video saying where are the men because these are all young kids that are writing where are the men to take take the balaclavas off get the kids in place and that and i'm saying that because i know i knew what the government would do what the government have done is use that reaction to totally hide 
the reality of why the British public are angry. Now, why are the British public angry? What they don't want to show you. So in Tamworth, Google the Tamworth riots. You'll just see that it was far right riots because that's what Keir Starmer told everyone. It's the far right. It's racism. In Tamworth, a local a Muslim housed for, paid for and housed in the immigration hotel went out and raped a woman. I'm pretty sure it's going to piss off people in that town. Yeah, One of the people that we've paid for as taxpayers to come into our country that we didn't want, let's face it, because the majority of the British public have, have voted and every poll for the last 20 years has said we want an end to mass immigration and they've accelerated it year on year. Yeah, So people that we didn't want, if we had a controlled border, if you look at Hartlepool, Google Hartlepool, far right racist riots. No, a, a, a Muslim terrorist who was housed in the hotel that you invited in, he went out of that hotel and stabbed a 70 year old pensioner who went to buy a newspaper in the morning to death for Gaza. Yeah? If, and then if we look at all these towns and cities, Yarmouth, yes, one of the Muslims left the hotel and raped women. Do you know 12 hotels? They've, they've left the hotels and raped women. 12. Bournemouth, where there were protests. In Bournemouth, a migrant come in, and, and these, these stories are in every town and city. A migrant come in, he come into the UK from Afghanistan. He said he was 15. So there was questions over him being 15. They put him into school. Yeah, There were questions in the school that he wasn't 15. He was sexually harassing girls in the school. I believe he threatened someone with a knife in the school. Of course, he didn't get expelled because he was a, a refugee. He then goes on five years later to stab a 21-year-old Royal Marine to death in, in Bournemouth town centre. At that point, even though they knew there were warnings at the start, at that point, they do an investigation into, the, into this Afghan refugee. They find out that he wasn't 15 when he come in. He was 19 or 20. Then they find out he shot two people dead in Serbia with a machine gun on the way to Great Britain. So a man who shot two people dead with a machine gun was put into a school in Bournemouth even though they knew he wasn't 15, even with all the warnings. So the failures from the Home Office, the failures from the government have left a father, because I listened to the interview of the father, my heart broke for the man, yeah? His only son, an aspiring young English man who, who'd done well at school, who joined the Royal Marines to be a successful citizen, was murdered by someone that our government let in. And that's just one example, and you can replicate that. For example, in the documentary that I've got coming out next week, and the reason I've stayed abroad is because I believe, we'll see this week, I believe I'll be imprisoned when I get back to the UK. And I wanted to make a video and a documentary to show the world. I'll show you why the British public are angry. It's not because of far-right ideology. It's got nothing to do with far-right ideology. It's got to do with government failure and after time and time again. And their failures have now taken the safety of our doors. They've taken the safety of our mothers and our women. Our women are no longer safe in every town and city. And I challenge anyone to do this. Go put in refugee rape leads. You'll see a woman jogger got raped. Go and put in refugee. And do you know the other crazy thing? Go and put in York. Pick any city you want and put in refugee rape and you'll read a case. Like if there was one, we've got a problem. But every city in our country, refugees are raping women. And then put in murders. They're doing the same. Refugee rape Leicester. You'll see two refugees rape the bloke. Yeah. Look at the men that they're bringing into the military bases. Have a look at the... Uh, Wooten Bassett, no, 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 the Cambridgeshire case. They raped two, two Libyans who were based at the military base, went out and raped a bloke who was riding his bike in the park. In every town and city, this is the reason the British public are angry. You've took our safety. Now, if we had controlled borders, none of these women and none of these people had to be murdered. None of the women had to be raped. None of the parents had to be fearful. We'd need to control the borders and you're not controlling the borders. And even after all the anger that was vented across our entire country in the riots, yeah, this summer, they still haven't spoke about one of these agenda, one of these problems. They still haven't addressed any of them. They've not said, OK, Keir Starmer had an opportunity to come out and be a statesman and say, we understand. We've just been elected. We understand why you're scared. We understand why you're angry. We're going to put it to bed. We're going to get rid of the people that are a danger. We're not going to let in criminals anymore. But instead... He wants to give them more amnesty and he, the, the borders open even more. So people are angry and people are upset. It, as you can see, it angers me. And in my research, this documentary, we interviewed a girl. She's at Oxford University. One of the migrants in the hotel. Again, these are migrants that we're housing. We're housing, we're feeding, we're clothing. We're putting them up. He went and raped her. So he's destroyed her life. We interview her and her dad. And what, what's your answer to that, Keir Starmer? That she, she's a racist, is she? Is her dad far right? Or is, he a, or, or, or is he a betrayed British citizen? Because you've betrayed him. Government after government have betrayed our people. 
And it frustrates me. So I wanted to put together a documentary, which I have done. Um, it will go out on the 26th of October, whether I'm there or not. Um, I believe, you know, you said, well, we get in places. We have got places. Um, I believe now the public are fully awake. I, I'm very surprised, James. We'll go out later yeah, and meet British people on the streets. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be surprised how many of them are awake to everything. I'm shocked. Yeah, I'm not even surprised. I just know people are scared to lose their, 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 their jobs. They're scared to lose their house. People are going to send to prison. It's not that people just don't have the balls or the guts to then step forward and see how they really feel. We're living in a society where everybody's dumbed down to quiet and down to shut up. Oh, look what happens. The fear factor is fear controls the world. Fear. But they, but they didn't. I don't. But but five years ago, I don't believe they were awake to what's happening now. Now they're awake. I'm yeah. telling you, I can see it. I, I I see it everywhere I go. I'm shocked at people, the old people coming up to me are reading, watching everything, fully awake to it. And what, the, what, what Keir Starmer's tyrannical government done is they tried to, they saw Britain, I believe, truthfully believe, is on the verge of a revolution with the public. The public are awake. We know it's not right. And we want our country back. Yeah. And that's, and that message is what we gave loud and clear. First of all in June. And then on the 27th of July. Now, when 100,000 patriots travelled to London, that would have terrified the establishment. Terrified them. So what did they do with the riots? They live streamed. They sent camera crews. And, and my heart breaks for the men that are in jail. We currently have political prisoners. People need to realise that. Because we've gone and we've interviewed the families for our upcoming documentary. Men who shouted, Allah, 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 who the fuck is Allah, were given 18, 18 months in prison. Okay? One lad, lad said, whose streets are streets? waved his St. George's flag. Two years. Two years. Like, what? You emptied the prisons of rapists, criminals, and real criminals, and you've put in working, hard-working British men. The men that have gone to jail for many of these riots, yes, there were men that overstepped the line. Yes, there were men that were violent. And if they were in those riots and rioting and burning things, they deserved the, the, the full weight of the law against them. But that's not who they locked up. They locked up people for sharing memes. They locked up people for sharing memes. The meme one lad shared was a boat arriving with lots of Muslims running onto the beach saying, what about when it's in your town? Well, what about when it is in your town? Because now it is in your town. I spoke to a woman last week who said she used to hate me. She said, now they filled a local hotel at the end of her little village. And she said, we're all scared. So welcome to the real world. Welcome to how we've, we've, we've been brought up with that in Luton Town. I know what it's like. So, and I just think that the public were there. They saw the mass, the mass awakening there's been a mass awakening for everything, not just immigration, uh, big pharma, all these things. People are joining the dots together to understand that we are controlled. The government are elected. We don't live in a democracy. We don't have freedom of speech. We don't. We simply do not have it. We live in a post free speech era. And anyone who speaks out or tries to speak out is attacked. And people didn't mind when it was Tommy Robinson being censored. In fact, they celebrated it. But then when COVID happened and we started seeing doctors, nurses, scientists, mm -hmm. everyone censored and deleted. Yeah, people start asking questions and they ask questions about everything because I had you on the podcast twice last year I think when you just got out of prison I think you were with your dad but you seemed very reserved mm -hmm. you had no platform you, know, you had more army on the Muslim man whose life you saved he was suicidal his son was suicidal with the false accusations and now you've got X back but you seem a different animal well John I'll tell you what happened I was lost totally lost um, I was sent to everything the film silenced that we're talking about so I, I now face four years in prison when I return to the UK I made a film there was a story where a Syrian refugee had a bottle of water poured over him that was the story and it was said that he got waterboarded and I got contacted by parents at the school and children at the school say this isn't the full picture he beats up girls he all these different allegations so I made a video saying listen you're not getting the full picture and the reason I've done that was because £180,000 had been donated to the Syrian refugee because we were being told by the media, not just the media, Sarvi Sar Javid, in, who was our Home Secretary at the time, invited him to Parliament. Piers Morgan, uh, Jeremy Vine, every lead television, every programme in the country was saying he was an innocent refugee and he'd been racially bullied because he was a refugee. And what I found out in, when I investigated, which was what any normal journalist should have done, was the total opposite. The story was the total opposite. Yeah, total opposite. So I then made a video saying, stop donating your money. Because right? you've been lied to. So they then issued court proceedings against me and, and began to sue me. So I was told to apologise and pay £50,000. At that point, I contacted Katie Hopkins because I knew Katie Hopkins had been sued through the court. I said, Katie, I know what I said was true. 
She said, Tommy, you can't win. I said, no, I bought. How can't I win? I've only reported as a journalist what I've been told by families. She said, I'm telling you, you can't win. Do you know what they've done to me? And then she went through what they'd done to her. And she said that, so her new husband had savings in his account from before he got with her. They took it all. The banks took it all. The, uh, the court took it all. So she, they wiped her totally out, yeah? Which was the purpose of this, these court proceedings. It's a, it's a process of lawfare. When they, tr they try to shut you up, if they can't shut you up, bankrupt them. It's like Alex Jones. Look at everyone who spoke out. They've all been bankrupt. So they took me through the courts. I stupidly, not stupidly actually, I refuse to back down. The reason I refuse to back down is in the middle of this story, there's a child called Bailey. When this story blew up all over the country, this English boy was called a racist by all the media, by everyone. He was a racist bully. That's what the story was. I traveled up to interview the family at the time to find out what had actually happened. And when I got to a hotel on the outskirts of Huddersfield, I met the mother, Bailey, and to think now what he went through, my son's now 15, to think what this kid was going through, right, at 15 years old is insane. That he'd ha ha it, We'll get onto it. He tried to kill himself, but, and, and his two nine-year-old sisters. The mum's crying. And she says, um, Tommy, I've spent all my Christmas money. Yeah, we're hiding in the hotel. Because from this story going global, and Piers Morgan saying, demanding severe retribution against Bailey, yeah, Jeremy Vine giving his name out, telling everyone his name, where to find his name on Twitter. Everyone damning this child with, from a 10 second clip of him pouring a bit of water on a, on a refugee kid. Yeah? You don't get any context. We well, do have context actually, because Bailey's saying, what are you saying now? Yeah? So something's been said, something's happened. He pouring a bottle of water, that's it. And the, the refugee boy had his arm in plaster and we were told by Jeremy Vine and other journalists who didn't investigate anything, that his arm was broken in a similar racist attack. So I go up and meet this family. And I look, and the two little nine-year-old nine sisters, they've, they've had to be escorted out of their house with police escort because there was a, f a threat to life. Muslims had turned up in gangs at the school and the house, threatening to rape, kill the family. Yeah? And so I, I said, well, where, where are you going to stay? She said, we've got nowhere to stay. I said, okay, um, you can stay with me. And, and they lived in Huddersfield. So... We, they stayed in the hotel. The next day, we got a transit van, me and my cousin Kevin. We drove back up. I picked up the family, and they come and lived at my house. Yeah, So they're living at my house. I'm watching this story go global. And then I start, and, 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 and then they start suing me. So I put together, I, I know the truth, because I spoke to everyone in the community. I know the truth. So I'm sitting thinking, why is no one telling the truth? How come no one's telling the truth? Well, why, aren't the why are the teachers silent on this issue? So I wear a hidden camera, and I, start, I think, right, I'm, I, I need the public to know what I know. And I need to prove it to them. So I go up to the teacher's houses, one by one. The first teacher that comes out, an Asian teacher, he says, Tommy, I took the money. I said, what do you mean? He said, they paid us. And this is all on the documentary. I said, who paid you? Kirkley's council. I said, okay, what did they pay you for? For? I can't talk about the, the Syrian refugee. Yeah. I said, okay, what was he? Okay, you can't talk about him. So... You can't, because I've got a court case to defend now. I went to court, first of all, and I showed the judge. Here's the messages from the mother who alleges Jamal attacked her daughter. Yeah? Here's the pictures of her daughter being beaten up. Okay, Here's the other post. This is So before my involvement in this case, multiple women and girls made, ap made accusations against the Syrian refugee. Then they all deleted their comments, and then the mother puts out a statement saying, I lied. Yeah, So I go to the teacher's house and he goes he says do you know what he goes Jamal come up to he, he goes do you know what my job was at the school I said what he said I, I was in charge of the isolate, isolation unit he said Jamal was a little shit he was always in the isolation unit so okay he goes he come up the isolation unit to beat another girl up so I'm, I'm recording all this so I think okay then I go to the woman who retracted her statement and I knock on her door Rebecca I said hello love do you know why I'm here they're, they're, they're saying I've lied They've told the public that I lied about this case. She said, Tommy, they're threatened to rape us. I said, who threatened to rape you? She said, all the Muslims. She said, they're threatened to rape me and my daughter. I've got all this on camera. So I said, so, so I said that makes sense. So your retraction statement wasn't actually a retraction statement because you lied. She said, no. I said, so was Jamal involved in attacking your daughter? She said, yes, but I'm, I'm too scared. I said, and I fully understand why you're scared. So I said, okay. So I've recorded all this thing, right, I'm proving my case. I then go to the head teacher's house. Head teacher comes out and he explains that they blackmailed him all on camera. 
when he says they, he says this come from the top. Theresa May spoke about this at a United Nations meeting. And then they come into my office. They forced him to sign the non-disclosure agreement. I say forced him. They probably paid him because we put in a freedom of information request. And the local council headed by um, Mufti Pandor, so a Muslim gentleman who runs the council. So you got when, when I started looking at it, it all started unraveling. The Muslim who runs the council, his brother is Mufti Pandor. So Shabir Pandor run, runs the council. Mufti Pandor is an imam who organised the protests outside the Batley school when the teacher had to go into hiding. So when this hit off in, in, in Huddersfield, his brother from... Four, four, there's 40 mosques closer, but his brother comes from Dewsbury, Batley, to organise protests outside this school as well. Yeah, so They're all involved in it. And at this time... In this city was the biggest grooming scandal, Muslim grooming scandal. So they got rid of the grooming scandal and this story, which painted the Syrian refugee as a victim of racism, was a world news story. Yeah, Pumped around the entire globe. Absolutely pumped. And the more I looked into the story, the, the video didn't organically go viral. The video was six weeks prior. The school had dealt with the incident. It had all been dealt with. Bailey got a t telling off for grabbing him. There was an investigation. It was, it was done and dealt with. The day before the video goes viral, a GoFundMe set up, they planned it all. Yeah? So I'm looking, again, this whole thing's been planned. How did they keep the silence? And then the head teacher says, they made me sign a non-disclosure agreement. I said, and then I knock up, so I go to another teacher's house and a woman answers and says, he's not going to talk to you, Tommy. And it was her son I was looking for. She goes, I can't talk to you either. I said, why can't you talk to me? She said, I'm not allowed to. I said, why wouldn't you be allowed to talk to me? She said, I'm a chair of governors at school. I said, they paid you as well. She says, yeah. And I've got it all on camera. So they literally paid everyone so no one could tell the truth. So then I get the school records and the school records show that the Syrian refugee was caught with a knife and screwdriver at school. Didn't get expelled. The school records show that he stabbed another pupil at school. Right? So I produce, I put all of this together. I then turn up at court. First of all, I argue I'm a journalist and as a journalist, I reported what I was told. The judge didn't recognise that and said, no, you have to prove this as truth. So then I had to fight and prove that every, what the only accusations I said, I said to Jamal threatened to stab someone. I said he threatened to stab Bailey and he attacks girls. Well, when I actually went around knocking at the doors, I find out that I get another girl, he spat in her face and slapped her. I get, an, I get another girl, he beat up with a hockey stick. I find another boy who witnessed him beat up the girl with a hockey stick. I find out far worse allegations than what I've been not told. So I piece it all together. I go to court and I'm thinking, I'm proving that this entire story has been fabricated from start to finish. And I produce it to the judge in the trial. We go to trial. Now, in all the emails, because I've recovered everything, I've got everything, yeah? Well, not everything, because they didn't, lots of it was blacked out. We weren't allowed to see lots of it. But in the emails, Jamal had a caseworker. His caseworker says, who worked for Jamal, says he wasn't the innocent party that's being portrayed, yeah? Every bit of evidence pointing to the fact that what I'd reported was the truth. Seven teachers on covert recordings. So I produced it all to the judge. The judge lists everything that, I'd, that I showed. He rules against me. He sa so, so he says that the seven teachers and five pupils that come and testified. Now, I'd done an interview yesterday of Alex Phillips and I broke down in the interview about it because we, five children come to court and testified. One of the girls is a, a young girl called Charlie. I knocked on her door wearing a covert camera, which is what I've done with this whole investigation. It's covert recordings. I knocked on the door. She answered. She was being homeschooled at the time. She didn't like me. And I sat down in her house and spoke to her about Jamal and about Bailey. Now, she was attacked. She says, because she put up on, on social media, she was attacked with a hockey stick. So I said to her, okay, why did you delete the post? She said, because everyone was threatening me. She said, everyone was threatening me. I had about 200 threats. My mum made my mum come in and her mum sits there and says, I made her delete the post. I said, well, will you testify? Because then I think, I've got to prove this. yeah, And I can't prove it without people coming to court. So will you testify? She said, yeah. I said, okay. And then I got five pupils, another boy. So when he gets his broken arm, when I knock at the head teacher's house, the head teacher tells me, he sits, and bearing in mind, if you're watching this, I'm going to jail for this next week. Yeah? It's insane. Right? So the head teacher sits down and says, as I, I, I go to his house three times. He says, do you know how he broke his arm? I said, no, I don't. But I did. He said he was attacking a boy four years younger than him. He had a boy who was four years younger than him in a headlock and someone pushed him off. That's how he broke his arm.
I said, but the media told us it was a racist attack. He said, total opposite. So I went and found the little boy who he was attacking and I interviewed the little boy who was about this big. But what, now, year seven to year 11. Year 11 was attacking a year seven pupil. So I interviewed a little boy and the little boy explains that he called his mother a white slag, yeah, as well. So I asked the boy and, and his family, will he come to court? So I'm, I'm shocked that I found lots of children. I found another boy who he beat up every day but that boy's family wouldn't let him come to court. I had another girl, they wouldn't let him come to court. But I managed to get five pupils that said they'll come to court, which I was shocked about. So then I, then I, I thought in court that the children can't be named. Reason being, anyone associated with me, they've made me a toxic brand, yeah? I, I'm, I'm getting through that, but they managed to make me a toxic brand. You face death threats, attacks and violence if, you're associ if your name or address or property is associated with me. So when we went before the judge, I said, look, the children are coming to give testimonies just don't name them. And he come back and said, no, they have to be named. So I said, so you're going to name, you're going to give their names, their addresses. Bearing in mind, the biggest rape scandal in our country's history was out of this town, Huddersfield. 30 men were convicted. It's actually the case that I was put in prison for in 2017. Yeah. So the threats aren't a joke when they're threatening to rape the women. Yeah. And these are young girls. Now this Charlie was a grade A student. She got 11 top grades. Yeah. In her school reports, which we read out in court, she was the only pupil in her year to not get one single negative. So the question was asked in court. She says she was hit with a hockey stick. Why would she lie? I wasn't involved at this point. Why would that grade A student go online and lie? Then she's come to court to testify. So when she's in the dock, because I, I represent myself, I spent £100,000 first of all, and then I had no more money. So I had to represent myself for the final part. So I said to her, what are you currently doing now, Charlie? She said, I'm studying law at university. So you've got a grade A student and then you've got Jamal. Jamal has 117 disciplinary records. That's on his school records. For lying, <laughs> loads for lying. It's insane, yeah? The only, so, but the judge found, so the judge said they had to be named. So then I sat the kids down that night because it was due to be evidence the next day. I said, we lost today. So if you come and give evidence, they're going to name you, which means your name's going to go in the paper. Your addresses are going to go out, Yeah which in reality, I don't want you to do. And, and I should have, I think I should have fought harder. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have let her do it. I shouldn't have let her do it because she done it. She testified and bravely, do you know how, do you know, you know stress in a court, anyone yeah. knows the stress in a court, to be a 15 year old child, to come four hours to the capital city that she's never even been to the capital city, to be in the capital city, to then be put on the dock and grilled by barristers and, and defence teams. And she stood and when asked why she's come, she said, because my parent, my family told me that the truth matters, brought me up to believe that the truth matters. So she testified and gave her evidence and he named her. And at the end of his judgment, he named them all. And at the end of his judgment, um, he found in the most, this is the most senior judge in our country. He found that sometimes people lie. They don't need a reason to lie. They just lie. So I don't give a shit. You, you called me a liar to the whole country, but now you're calling this grade A student and her name is forever etched in the newspapers and online. Yeah. She dropped out of her university course. She had a total breakdown from this. I shouldn't have let her give, I shouldn't have really let her, I should have been more responsible and I shouldn't have let her give test to me, but there's no way I thought, I thought, how can we lose this court case when seven teachers are on covert recording saying he's a little shit, he beats, one, one of the women teachers says, he, 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 women couldn't talk to him. Women could not talk to this kid. His opinion of women was devastating. I said, what was he like? She said he was a horrible little shit. That's the teacher. Yeah, that's the teacher. Another girl come to court and gave test to me that he slapped her and spat in her face. So the judge found that these five pupils just come and commit perjury. Because to find against me, he had to find they all lied. And he said that everyone lied, apart from Jamal. Uh, and, and the only person to give evidence for Jamal was his dad, Jihad. His dad's fucking name's Jihad, yeah? So it's mental. So this, and the judge found this. So he rules against me. He, he hits me for 1.6 million pounds, yeah? Which was the purpose of this. This is lawfare. That's what the reason of this was. This was to destroy me, to take everything I own, to bankrupt me and leave me on the bottom. Yeah, that's why they've done it. It's what they've tried to do. So this, he bankrupts me and I then leave the country. I come out and do you know what? I've done a, I've done a podcast with Katie Hopkins and our stories are exactly the same. She gets made bankrupt. She thinks, you know what? My kids are better off without me. She, got, she leaves to America. 
because she doesn't want her kids to forever be tarnished with the name that they've now ma managed to give her. She was the most hated woman in Britain. Not anymore. What, the most loved. Because we, we now see. People have seen through their bullshit and their lies. But she was hated. And as I spoke to her, so she left. I come out. I went and spent 28 days at rehab straight after the court case. And do you know when I went to the rehab? I, I sat there and it was the first time you deeply look at yourself as well. And I needed a break, man. I, I absolutely felt broken, exhausted, tired, um, they they went and told the whole country I fucking lied. And I knew I had this documentary which proved everything, yeah? But what the judge done, he said, if any of this is ever shown, you receive a two-year prison sentence. Because I found this big, fat, overweight mess who's never had a missus or kids because I looked him up. So whatever they've got, got on him, yeah? And, and bearing in mind, so people who trust the judiciary think we have a a legal system, a justice system. We have a legal system. When they want to hit you with it, they will hit you with it. Now, Johnny Depp, the same court that found against me, found against Johnny Depp in the UK. Yeah, Ruled against all the evidence. So police officers come to court and give evidence. They ignore them. And they found and ruled against Johnny Depp. They ruled for his wife, for the political reason of the Me Too movement. When in reality, as soon as Johnny Depp gets the public to be able to watch the case in America, because it's different in America, he clears his name. But I've never been... So I, I come out of court... Given, a, given an injunction, I didn't even fucking read the injunction. Just, it, it just said you can't air your film, basically, yeah? You can't air your documentary or you get two years in prison. I come out, I spent 28 days at rehab. I sat there. Um, you have to sit around with a group of people. I don't know if you've ever... Mm -hmm. You have to sit around. Meetings? Meet, yeah, you have to sit around and you have to... Everyone says, why are you here? Yeah, first day. I said, for a fucking break. That's the truth. I'm here for a break, man. I'm fucked. And uh, it was the start of COVID at, at the time. There was nowhere to go. And, uh, and then uh, you don't have your phone. And then, you re and then I sat there talking about my life and I cried my eyes out with it. I couldn't believe it. And I, I would always have sat and said, people who sit and talk about their problems are pussies. Yeah? Stop man the fuck up. That's what I always would have said. And I felt like that's what I would have said to my son as well. Don't cry. Boys don't cry. Men are tough. We deal with shit. Right? But really, you just bury it. So I sat there and every time I tried to talk, I was shocked because I just blabbered and I had a breakdown. And I thought, because I probably, up until that point, this was only 2019 or 20, was it, or even 21. I had never spoke about any of probably my fears. And what I realized is that everything that drives me to a dark place is what I'm scared of and probably never want to admit you're scared of anything. So it's all fears. And my fears aren't coming from getting hurt or killed couldn't give a shit I walk into them yeah my fears are from the establishment and what they're going to do to me and my family and it's what they have done and it's what's about to happen now so again now I'm going back to face what four years in prison are they going to let them have me in prison are they going to put me on solitary confinement for two years am I going to sit in a room without leaving it for the next two years am I going to see anyone so all of these fears but do you know where so I decided for the first time in my activism and my life of activism since 2009, when I started the English Defence League, I went full 100% into it. And I made that decision and shook my cousin's head, hand and said, you can't put one foot into this. You can't. Yeah. I, I've grown up with the Muslim community. I know how, I know how they work. They work on fear. You show them one bit of fear, you're fucked. Yeah. You should, they actually respect strength. They actually do, yeah? I said, if, if I run once, I'll be running for the rest of my life, so we can't run, yeah? So I have to just stand and stand on this point, and and, and, and I become a great leader for the English Defence League. A bad husband, I've said this in many interviews, a terrible husband, probably a shit dad, but I was a great leader, yeah? And that's why the English Defence League become a household name across the world, not just in England. We went 100% into it. And I always said... I've made I've made I've made decisions in in this time that have landed me in prison. I've, I've illegally entered America. I've I've done so many things, but I didn't care about the consequence because I, I always said if you worry about consequence, you're never going to bring about bring about change. You have to be a revolutionist to bring about change. We have to just do what we need. We I believe is right to do to wake up the public to bring about that change. So then I'm given this injunction, and I failed myself. I failed myself. I failed myself as a journalist. I failed myself as an activist. I failed myself because I allowed them to silence me. Something I hadn't let them do for years. And I allowed them to because I was scared. I was scared of prison. I'd seen the effect it had on myself mentally, the solitary confinement. I was fucked. I, in 2017, I went into jail one person and come out a different person. 
and, and it sounds mad, but I was fucked, yeah, in communicating with my family, in, in everything. So I knew that that took ages to get back to any sort of normality. I knew the effect it had had on my children. So I made the decision not to air the film. When I should have walked out of court and just pressed play. I should have walked out of court and said, you see you, Justice Nicklin, I believe in freedom of speech. I believe in freedom of the press. I believe in what, I totally believe in what I stand for. So I should have played the film and I bottled it. So I bottled it and then I moved to Tenerife. I moved to Tenerife. As I said, I was in a bad, bad place. Um, I, my, this film, if you watch it, resulted in my divorce. It resulted in threats to murder my family. It resulted in my ex-wife now making a decision to put the children first, the best decision she ever made, and me living separately and, leave, and leaving the family home. So I was, I went to Tenerife and I booked into um, a martial arts camp. I spoke to you about it, didn't I? Mm. I, book, I booked into a martial arts camp. Where was that? Uh, Steve Costa Fitness. Absolutely brilliant, man. Do you know, the thoughts so are what I tried to do. You know Jason Vale? The juice guy? Jason Vale, the juice guy, yeah? So I went, sounds gay, I went before this. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a juice camp. Yeah. <laughs> I went to it. <laughs> I, went, <laughs> I went to a juice camp and it was a, you know, to reset. I think every, every year, everyone should have a reset, a reality check, a time alone, a time to think, a time to detox. Um, I was abusing myself, abusing my body. Um, so I went to this juice camp. I went first, I went with my mate and I fucking, the benefit it had for me in one week there, it benefited me so much, man. This was the year before. So it benefited me so much. And then it got to that, that point. So I went again to the juice camp. And I went with my mate, Madly, who's called Jamal, Pakistani, Muslim boy from Luton, who I grew up with, yeah? We went together. Now, Jason Vale come to the juice camp each time I was there. So he was there the whole time I was there for a week. We played volleyball together. You do, you do long walks in the morning. I'd never gone on walks. You go on hikes. Um, you don't eat. You're just given juices. You're given detox stuff. You, you, um, it's a health week. It's, it's beautiful. It's in the middle of nowhere. There's no distractions. Time to think about everything. Yoga. So, so this time I think, right, I'll go reset again. I need a reset again. I'll go to Jason Vowles. So I go to book online and I get an email back from him, uh, from them saying, sorry, you're not allowed to come. So what do we mean I'm not allowed to come? So then uh, they say, well, sorry, we've had to make this decision based on the business that we don't want you here, yeah? So I thought, I spent two weeks with you. You were sound with me, proper sound with me. So was everyone I was there. Everyone liked me, I got on with everyone. So then I rang up, then I rang him up and I recorded him. And he goes, Tommy, I'm sorry, man. Look, it's not you. I know you're not the person they say you are. I know you're not, because I've met you. But I just can't, it's a business decision. I said, so everything you say is bullshit. Because he stands and gives this big speech about how this is the place where you can come and forget about your life, whatever you've got going on in your life, whoever you are, Come here, reset, yeah? And, uh, and I'll be honest, so I recorded the conversation. I recorded everything, and then I thought, you, you, fucking, you fucking arsehole, yeah? And um, because I needed that reset. I needed a time. And I felt that he, he pushes himself, Jason does, and I watched it through COVID. I'm still, I'm still happy he spoke out against COVID, and he was one of the people who spoke. But he, and he's a working-class lad, yeah, who's done very well. You hear his life story. When you go to the juice camp, you hear his life story. Um, I respected him. And then I thought, you're a coward. You know I'm not that guy. In fact, you don't just know I'm not that guy, but I, I just stayed in a room with a Pakistani Muslim, my mate, who, who you met. You saw our friendship. So you know it's all bullshit what they're saying. So I'm going through that. And then, uh, but he didn't. But I didn't share the, I didn't share the video. Right. Because I believe it's a brilliant place to reset. I read a surprise, I read a message. <laughs> Stay off that coke, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it will say in the comments. Sniffed off his head. <laughs> you know, man. But um, I read a message that my ex-wife had sent Jason Val, which she never told me. Basically called him an arsehole and a cunt and a coward and how he sells himself as this place for your mental health. And yet, when it when well, she says when her, when her when her husband needed it, he blanked it through pressure of what he knew wasn't the truth. But I would still say it was an amazing place to go. And, and if, you're, if you need a reset in your life, then it was brilliant. But then, then I found Steve Costa Fitness, yeah? So 
I was looking for somewhere to go. I booked in this place for three weeks. Steve Costa Fitness is a Scottish lad. Um, it's in Tenerife. The value for money was unbelievable. Yeah. So it's a martial arts camp. You go there. You. It, it, I, I, I booked for free. <coughs> I booked for three weeks, and I stayed for three months. <coughs> you do train. When I went, I was unfit. So I'd done a before and after picture. My transformation was unbelievable in that time. But I still wasn't in a great place. I was in a bad place. Still was in a bad place. And it was the first time then, and, and I met some lads there, but I went there and the group changed each week. There's about 10 people on it a week. <clears throat> and they do beach training. It's so fucking good, man. For the value for money. Say it costs about a grand a week. You get a two-bed apartment. You get three meals a day. You back, 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 say it's about a grand a week. You get a two-bed apartment, three meals a day, and training if you want, seven or eight hours a day. It's like training all day. So 7.15, 7 you, you go down the beach, you do training on the beach, squats, jogging, running, you're in the sea. It makes it all fun. So you do an hour there, then you go back, then you've got pads 10 to 11, then you've got lunch, you've got circuit at one o'clock. Now you can do as little or as much as you want. I started off unfit, fat, mess, doing one hour a day. In the end, I was doing three hours a day. I was fit as a fiddle. I got myself into a very good place, a better, a better place. But then the, this film was released. So the film that I didn't release was released in America. Who released that? Was that you behind that? No, I'd own it, yeah? I'd own it. I'd ask Alex Jones, who was in possession of it, not to air it, because I didn't want to go jail. I is this silenced? This is silenced. So I said, don't release it, man, because I, I, I don't need it. I don't need it. But I was still had it all hanging over my head. And do you know what? It didn't get released straight away, but I probably stayed in Tenerife for a year. And the fact that I didn't release it, et me. Et me up. Drove me to, in, I've been driven to points of insanity many times, but this drove me to a point of insanity because I'm thinking, I've got a grenade that is that will blow up their judiciary's reputation around the globe, yeah? And I want to throw it, and I fucking should throw it because of what they've done to me. They, 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 this, this, this story, this lie that they manufactured, not just what it's done to me, the damage it's done. Do you know the head teacher? So I knock on the head teacher's door, the... It, Part of his non-disclosure agreement, and he was, he was politically opposed to me. He tells me that on the covert recordings. But what a man. When I met him, he, joined he says, I joined education to help poor children, Tommy. That's why I joined. Look what they've done to me. So this story comes up. Global news. The, the government knows a lie, obviously. Media knows a lie. The, he sits and says, we told the media the truth, Tommy. They wouldn't report it. Why was it global news? For what? Because it painted a picture that, of the narrative that they want. Open border. Refugees, innocent victims, English racist bullies, mass border immigration's good, this poor Syrian refugee, it painted the English as bad. So do you know they said it was because he was a refugee? So I went with a covert recording to prove this. Kids fighting schools every fucking day. Mate, in comparison, I, in comparison to videos of other things that happened at school, this was nothing. Yeah. But it was manufactured. And I went I went and knocked on some young girl's door. So I heard some real great stories of Syrian refugees that had joined the school. So there was a little girl and I knocked on her door. Again, I feel bad doing it, but you can watch it on the documentary. I knocked on the door and said, hello, darling. I'm just, I'm a reporter. I'm just finding out. I understand you, you're a refugee. You come to this school. And she says, yes. And her dad's there. And she says, when I come to this school, my first year, I had one friend. Now I have loads of friends. And then now I can speak English. I said, how are you finding it, darling? She said, I, I love it. It's been brilliant. I said, I said, have you faced any problems because you're Syrian or a refugee? And the dad says, there's been no problems. Now, this, this community in Hudsfield was branded by the entire country as a racist hellhole. Yeah? And all these other Syrian families, seven of them, I put one of them in the documentary, but I've, I've reached out to seven families, have all progressed. A success story of a young girl. She was a very pleasant young girl, the father of the family. The community loved them. I spoke to all the neighbours. They said they're lovely. Yeah? So this didn't happen because he's a Syrian refugee. This happened because he's a little shit. Yeah? And I, do I blame him for being a little shit? No, he was a 15-year-old child who's come from a war zone, yeah? But come from a war zone, the minute he got caught with a knife, he should have been expelled. The minute he hit a girl, he should have been expelled. You'll bring in the problems. And this, the problem is, that what, the reason why the government want to hide this, this, this family were one of 20,000 families that were brought into our country at the height of the ISIS conflict. And the public didn't want them brought into the country. And the government made the decision to import them in from, the, from, from, ref, from refugee camps. So they brought them in. Now, this is the tale of one of those families, and the tale of it was a tale of total destruction through the school. And, and victims, English children, girls, boys, everyone, are becoming victims of what they've imported into our school.
And that's going on across the whole country. So rather than deal, because if the truth could be told, Sajid Javid sat with this boy on TV, Theresa May spoke about it. If the truth could be told, your policy and your failure have caused mayhem in that school for many children, English children. But you don't care about the English children. No one cared about Bailey McLaren. So that family come to live with me Christmas Eve, he tries to kill himself, commit an overdose. I read the mental health reports on the documentary. No one cared about him. There was no one, do you know, for six months they lived, in, they lived with me, for six months. Do you know when they moved them? So they were trying to get relocation, the council, no one would help them. They're ringing everyone, no one give a shit, right? The little sisters, they were nine, ten, started self-harming. Yeah, there was a, only, then I, I said, give me the phone, yeah? I said, how the fuck are you not got these kids in education? They're 10 years old. Six months it's been, they're sitting here. How have you not put them in a school place? Oh, who am I talking to? I said, Tommy fucking Robinson, they're living at my house. They said, they're living at your house. I said, yes, they're in my house. This family are living with me for the last six months. Then they relocated them out of an emergency for fear, fear of radicalization. <laughs> I swear to God. So anybody that's wanting a house, just see us doing the top of us. They relocated the family, but Bailey stayed. Bailey stayed for three years. The kid. I got him an apprenticeship with my mates. Do you know the, do you know what? He he and he was a tough kid, yeah? From a tough upbringing. Had a real hard upbringing. A polite, well spoken, well mannered, tough young man, yeah? Yeah, yeah, he was the kid who decided to stick on the Syrian refugee. What you find out in the documentary from one of the teachers is that apparently the Syrian refugee threatened to rape his nine-year-old sister. But the public wasn't given any of this information. Now, I'm a journalist. It's my job to give you this information. And it's also my job to give him a right, right to reply. So in this documentary that I made, the film gets leaked. I mean, I'm in Tenerife for a year. I don't know what I do with myself, to be honest, yeah? I don't know whether I'm coming or going. Um, I'm seeing my family as much as I could. I'm trying... I've got no stability, yeah? I just want to be home, if no I'm honest. No social media. No, no social media. All good. I, I, I moved to a company called Getter, and then when Nigel Farage joined Getter, he told them to get rid of me. Fucking mental, man. So I've joined Getter. I've, I've gone to Telegram. So we've still, I've, I've, I've continued my work as best I could. And then I started a documentary series called The Rape of Britain, which, again, I think I never, I never thought Again, this is me. I've got girls to tell their stories. I went and spent 12 to 18 months in the town of Telford. And I sat down with dozens of young girls who had been victims of Muslim rape gangs. And I gained their trust. And I got to know their families. And I got to know them as individuals. And then I interviewed them for three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, three times, four times. And then we put together a database. And I had a fantastic team who I've got around me for my work, for Urban Scoop. Because I didn't want to let them win. So if I just stopped working, they've won. I want, and I knew when they imprisoned me in 2017 for talking outside, outside Leeds Crown Court, they, they imprisoned me for talking about the grooming gangs. At that time, they fucked me in that prison sentence, yeah? And then they sent me back to jail for the same sentence. I've done 13 months and 10 months for asking convicted paedophiles how they feel about their sentence. But it, I promised myself when I come out, you done that to stop me talking about it? Nah. I'm going to show the world about it. I'm not just going to not going to talk about it. I'm going to make films about it. I'm going to come after the people with the dirty hands. I'm going to show everyone who you are. So I, I put together a database over 12 to 18 months. And you can watch our, the documentaries are fabulous. We do a police style investigation. When the men, the rapists are named by three or more girls, when they're named by three or more who don't know each other, we go after them. When I say go after them, we make them famous. I go into their businesses. Do you know the satisfaction I took in seeing the, fucking colour drain out of their faces when I know you've been raping kids and they're not just do you know the, the success stories of their lives they're all driving sports cars they've all got businesses they've all got takeaways they're all very successful they've all got their own Muslim families but they've left a trail of destruction of English girls who are hooked on drugs hooked on alcohol who are suicidal who are self-harming yeah and you fuckers are still still living the life of Riley and the police identified two in the town of Telford the police identified 200 rapists they prosecuted 11 what about the others so then I thought, right, well, I'll come to Telford. The reason I chose Telford, Telford has a 1.7% Muslim population. But the police identified 200 men. There's only 1,000 Muslim men in Telford. So I thought, I can find out everything I need to know about the you lot in Telford. I can do my read. I found out everything, yeah? I knew where they lived. I put trackers on their cars. We had bugs. We went to town on their gangs, yeah? And they had no idea. We were in their restaurants undercover, we had people undercover talking to them, laughing with them, getting to know them. They had no idea. We were building a fucking database on them. 
And then when, so then when it was time for them to know, I put out the trailer, the first trailer, and I put 200, all their faces on the wall, yeah, in, in our promo. And to let them know, because I thought, these girls are looking after, over their shoulders every day. You lot need to be looking after your shoulders. But I didn't think about the effect it would have on the girls telling their stories. So the first girl to tell her story was a girl called Nicole, who was raped from the age of 11. And I just thought, well, tell, put out, tell her story. You've got to hear what they've done. You've got to hear it, man. And they're sitting in Lamborghinis, the fuckers. But they got a shock. They got a shock, man. When, because, and then, when I say they got a shock, they went to town. They blew everything up. They blew all the girls' houses up. They blew, they, they went, so they didn't know who's been talking to me. They just knew, they saw the promo and all their faces all over the wall and they're all thinking, shit. I thought, yeah, you're going to be famous, mate. So, and then I, when I find them, um, Golf Fresh Khan, I was fo we were following him. He went to Birmingham. So we're, we're in Birmingham. I thought, I can't jump out on him in Birmingham. I'm going, I will get killed. He's in the middle of uh, Alan Rock. So we follow him. And just as he gets to his house, I jump out of the car. I said, Golf Fresh Khan, I've got some questions to ask you. You've been trafficking children in this town. You've been raping children. These are pillars of the community. So uh, Charlie Khan, his brother, who I find as well, I'll get him outside KFC. But we, and we spent so much work on this. It was, it was such a project. But when I get him, he's, we got videos of him preaching in the mosque against grooming. It's one of the main fucking groomers. They're so blatant about it. Do you know the picture? When we put the whole investigation together, we have, you know, they do these diversity photos outside mosques, the police do. The man whose job it is to stop grooming is stood next to the main groomers either side, having a photo taken outside the police, outside the police station. There's no, we couldn't find a photo outside the Sikh temple, but outside the mosque, the police have all gone to have their diversity. We're stronger together, stronger together. They're all the rapists, bruv. They've all been raping the kids. So we've done this, we've done this five part series so far. It's brilliant. It's on Rumble. Watch it. It's the Rape of Britain. And one by one, they dropped the men. And then I go and find them. One of them, we, I hired a house, I rented a house. He's a boiler engineer. He's a boiler engineer. And even when I, I flew a victim, I've been talking to a victim for 12 months who was living abroad. And I fly her back into England. It's, it's during COVID, so I have to fly her via another country. She comes in and I'm waiting at the airport. And uh, the police nicked her. The police nicked her for making, for, for malicious communications because she named her rapists online. It's insane. The, the, the cover-up attempt that's still going on in our authorities and police to silence the victims and anyone talking about it, which is what they've done with when they put me in prison. So I thought, I'll make this, fight, I'll make this documentary. But do you know how disheartening it was making it at a time when you're... It's deflated. Well, not deflated. No one's get, no one's watching it. How? Why is there no backing for it? Why is it not getting exposed to the hill? Why is, like I say, the kids fighting in school? That's not newsworthy for me. But for the rapes and the the abuse and the child trafficking, that should be getting spoke from the hilltops. It should be, but then it goes against the utopia of the community of the country they're trying to build. This utopian idea that everyone's equal and every community is equal and there's no problems. And the, yeah, there are. You're importing people from Afghanistan. Ninety nine percent these are pure research figures 99% of people in Afghanistan want Sharia law that means that if 100 men come in from Afghanistan 99 of them want Sharia law they don't leave their view at the border you what is Sharia law? Sharia law they want which is sex with children there's no there's no legal age marrying children um, in, in, in Islam outside of your four wives you're allowed to take whatever your right arm possesses and again we look at this in the documentary we look at the reasons why because when we what is this documentary for people to see where can people see this the rape of britain on my rumble channel which is official tommy robinson mm. the rape of britain and this five part series so when we look at it and the reason we look at it listen to these numbers they will terrify you uh, 1.7 percent muslim population of telford police identified 200 men we identified 254 names an independent inquiry by a solicitor's firm in birmingham identified 300 it's only a thousand muslim men that means 20 to 30 percent of the men were raping kids in that town. Now, the other town we have figures for is Rotherham, where we have a 3.7% Muslim population and we have 1,400 children. John Telford, five are dead. Five have been murdered. From 1,000 men in the town, five kids have been murdered and 1,000 victims. If you want to understand how big the problem is, we only have the numbers on Telford and, and Rotherham. There's no Muslims there. I remember when I was going up to Telford, everyone was like, you need to be careful here. They run everything. I think, I think run everything. I'm from Luton Town. 50%. We've had it with them for years, right? We, no one in Luton, we didn't back down to them. How the fuck are they running your town with, with a thousand men? But they did, they do. They're like a mafia. The Benalis, that was their family, that's their gang name, which is to do with a tribal region they're from in Pakistan, where they've come from. The Benalis, that was their gang name. And you've even got Amir Khan doing videos going, big up the Benalis, yeah? This is, they, they reach, they control the heroin, they control the drugs, their, their violence, they control everything in that town. But the, I got, my satisfaction come when, None of them knew who, was, who I was coming after next. So I'm sitting there, but I'm thinking, 
I'm getting you, but I weren't really thinking of the girls because Nicole had a breakdown. Each girl had a breakdown. We're telling their stories. They're putting their faces up. Documentary after documentary. So then we tried, by episode three, I thought, right, we need to work on the centre. Would that go against them in court because they've already put information out there? How does that work? No, because the girls would get... Mate, the they third... gave statements. N Nicole gave a statement, had a DNA. She was pregnant at 13. They got the fetus of the baby and they still ain't charged him. They're just not charged him. Why? Because if they charged them, 200 of them... See, they're, they're basically making a handful of arrests in each town and city. And you cannot rely. So Telford police are totally corrupt. In episode two, we find Inspector Jim Bayliss. We get witnesses that he was taking money off the gangs. I go and find him and confront him in the documentary. And he, 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 he leaves a year before his pension. So the, the police knew. They obviously got rid of him with a little handshake. They knew he was working with the gangs. I go and find him and confront him. Saying, how, how, how did no more cases go? And cases collapsed. Cases he was in charge of, of Muslim paedophiles, collapsed. Bent police officers are working for him because there's so much money involved. They run everything. So, and, and when you look at what they're doing, we wouldn't have the prison places. We wouldn't have the court spaces. We wouldn't have the cost to take every one of these rapists. There's been that many rapes and there are that many of them involved in raping children that they're just putting 10 or 20. And the best thing that's happened is when police forces, say from Yorkshire or from different cities, it's handed over to the National Crime Agency because the National Crime Agency aren't in the town. So there's no way the Pakistani gangs can have influence in the, in the police in the National Crime Agency. So the National Crime Agency can come into a town and then just obliterate them, which is what we've been seeing when you see 30, 40, 50 of them getting done in different towns and cities. It's not the local police. Local police do nothing. So what causes them then to then with the grooming gangs because there's fights on both sides, both arguments on how with Islam, you take away religion, you take away skin colour. Are these people just bad or do you believe a religion they're following causes that? Because then on the other hand, I'm regular back and forth to Dubai, yeah. one of the safest cities in the world, Muslim city, unbelievable, people are friendly, great energy, everybody wants to help, 0% crime rate, near enough. Yeah. There's a lot of things that's amazing there. So how can you then say one well, do you know what I'm saying? What, what you can't blame is, Muslims for everything when you've got a Muslim city there that's one of the most thriving in the world as well. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's the mask. That yeah. Has. That's the mask that has. But I interviewed a Muslim girl who was forced to go back to her husband who beat her and raped her. Yeah. And, and she was forced by the Dubai police because she's not allowed to leave him because that's under Sharia law. Mm -hmm. So there's a mask that it looks beautiful and you can drink alcohol and you can party and there's prostitutes everywhere and everyone's taking drugs. That's fucking not an Islamic state. That's not an Islamic state. That's the reality of it, isn't it? It is. Everyone knows it. The boys, prostitutes everywhere, rent boys everywhere, all little knocking shops full of rent boys. They're all shagging the boys. So let's, let's cut the bullshit. It's, that's not an Islamic state. That's not an Islamic state. Let's see what the Taliban live under. They're, in Islam, they're, they're enforcing the Islamic state. What's it like there? What's it like for non-Muslims? So I always ask, in, in the UK, Muslim men, especially Pakistanis, Muslim men make up, well, Muslims make up 4 to 5%, they say, yeah, of the British population. They're responsible for 90% of the convictions of groups of men that rape kids. 90%. So why? So this is what, you're not even allowed to ask this question. This is why I'm hated. Why aren't the Sikhs? The Sikhs have come here in, in numbers. How come there's no groups of Sikh men, 10 of them, that are raping young kids? How come there's no groups of S Jamaican men in a group of 10 that are, that, that are acting this way? Or Jews? Or Hindus? Why is it Muslims in every town and city? We've got 65 fucking cities where they've been doing it. that have been systematically raping and torturing. So we look at what the men said. I look, I've done, I've done another presentation called The Rape of Britain. It's an hour and 20 minutes where I take what the men said in court. Don't take my word for it. The Somalian in Bristol said it was his religious duty to do it. Other of them commented the women shouldn't have been out late at night. Other of them said they shouldn't dress like that. It's all to do with their culture and their religious beliefs. So that's my belief, yeah? But you, I said, if you want to do an independent inquiry... Take the Quran, let's have an independent inquiry into it. Independent, into whether this book instructs and allows violence, war, rape and jihad against non-Muslims, because I know it does. So why are we allowing it to be pushed throughout our whole country? But that was the rape of Britain. I made that five-part series and in that, they blew up houses, you see them. They go to the family's houses, they set fire to them. Police do nothing. Watch the documentaries, police do nothing. The police tried to crack down. Then they went to my mums, the Muslims did. So I never thought, they rang me up. You listen to them on the documentary. They ring me up and tell me they're going to rape my daughters. They're going to get them outside school and rape my daughters. I identify who it is on the phone. I give it to the police. No arrests. You can listen to them phone me on, on the documentary. Then the, my mum's next door neighbour says, um, there's been a car full of Asian, Muslim, like Pakistani lads, video in my mum's house. So I get the number plate and I check the number plate for a private investigator and I get an address in Dudley. 
So I look at who lives at the address in Dudley. I think, right. And I go on his Facebook and he's friends with all the rapists from Telford. So I think your fuckers are lining up. They're lining up my mum's house. Now I've talked about Islam publicly. Yeah. I've talked about it a lot, but I've never homed in on individuals. Now I am. And they're under pressure. <coughs> they're shitting themselves. You know what? They're selling their businesses. All of them, pretty much all of them went to Pakistan. They all run away. I was at the airport waiting for two days because I knew they were going to be going out of Manchester airport. So I was trying to get them with cameras at the airport. But we literally stuck on them. And then I thought, then they went to my mum's. So I got his address in Dudley. And the next day I went to his house with about 40 lads. And I left the lads at the end of the drive. And I knocked on the door. And then it was Eid or Ramadan, whatever. So the house was full of women as well and children. So one young lad answered and said, Tommy, what the fuck are you doing here? I said, I'm after Imran. And I said, where is he? He goes, Imran's my uncle. I said, right, where is he? He goes, he's not here. I said, get him on the phone. I said, yesterday, day before, he was outside my mum's house, two hour drive, yeah? Tell him he doesn't need to drive two hours from me. I'll come and meet him here. I said, and then they looked and see the crowds at the end of the, uh, the drive and said, don't worry, they're here because you lot don't fight fair, right? I want Imran to come outside here and me and him can sort it out. And I've done it as a video to send, to send to the rest of the grooming gang saying, we're not dickheads or we're not hiding from you. If you think you're coming to my, my, my mum's house, I said, I already told him, your mum lives here, your dad lives here. I know where all your family live. Yeah, because you have to, with them, there's only one language they understand. So you're not targeting my mum's house, not without reaction. It's not like I'm not going to come straight around your house. So we, I, I went to his house. Imran comes on the phone and says, I sold the car. I said, bullshit, did you sell the car? I know your mates with the rapists and I know they're coming for them. And I had all the, I had the main gangster there's one of them, the main gangster lad from Telford. I know he's not a groomer because I've found out everything. Yeah, So he rings me up. They're all ringing me up. Their, ex, their wives are ringing me up. The, the, the Pakistanis' wives are ringing me up. They're raping their own kids. I never thought about Muslim women in this story. Yeah, in, When we talk about grooming, I only think of our women. I never thought about Muslim women being victims of anything, Yeah, to be honest. Mate, what I found out when I went into that the Telford investigation and I let everyone know I'm investigating, the amount of their wives, ex-wives, family members that were contacting me who live in fucking absolute fear. Absolute fear. One of them's raped his own daughter. It's insane. But then, yeah, so, Im and then I, so Imran said, uh, he said, oh, I sold the car. But I was, uh, then I made a video just saying, lads, if you think you're coming to my house, I'll, I'll, I'll know where you all are. Every one of you. And I'll come straight away the next day. But, that, but I'd never thought of that. But I never even thought of the, the effect on the girls then the effect of me sitting in this in the documentary, episode five, one girl, she puts a statement on Facebook saying, well, I'm going to be the first person to kill one of these Telford groomers. One of them was just getting out of prison. It was all over the news. So I looked her up and I paid a private investigator again and I, I tracked her down to a hostel in London. And she hated me as well. Yeah, She, she, was, a, uh, she was a bit of a hippie. I said, give me two hours of your time. I've read your post on Facebook. Give me two hours of your time. So she gets in the car. I talked to her, I said, look, I've been working on this gang for a year. I'm, I'm going to ruin them. You know, everyone, they're going to be famous. They can't walk the streets anymore in their hometown because everyone, everyone, their wives, their mums, their dads, everyone's going to know what they've been doing. And then, so I spent two hours talking to her. I go up to, I'm living in Manchester at this time. I'm, I'm, when I come back to England, I've got a house I'm staying in in Manchester. And I've got, I've got all the work out and we're researching the gang. We're doing, we're, we're piecing it all together. I get a message off this girl, which you listen to on the documentary is so powerful. She messaged me saying, you've got half hour, Tommy, to ask me whatever questions you need. Beyond that, you can't ask me anymore. So I ring her. I said, all right, what's going on? She said, I'm in Telford. I think, oh fuck. Like, last thing she said, she's going to go kill one of them. So I said, what are you doing in Telford? She said, I'm ending it, Tommy. And this is, this is all captured on camera. Yeah, which for me, you know, you which was one of the reasons for the films. You know, when you read about grooming, you just read about these statistics and numbers, 1,400 girls, 1,000 girls. Not when you watch the films, you hear from their mums and dads, you see the anguish, you see the pain. So to have this girl who was raped 10 years prior on the phone and she breaks down and I say, darling, your mum and dad love you. Where are you? I'm going to come pick you up. Do not do anything stupid. And then she just bursts into tears and she's breaking down and she says, rape is torture, Tommy. My whole life's torture. Every time she gets a new sexual partner, every time she has sex, she's told me this when we're in the car, she, she envisages them. She can't have a relationship. All from the rape from these gangs from the years before. So then she just breaks down and says, I'm ending my own life. I'm killing myself. And then no one can say it's not because of them. And I'm at the, the, the moment in the conversation, if you listen to it, it's a 10 minute conversation. I'm like, oh, fucking hell, man, please. And I said, I've just had the worst fucking curry, yeah? Which is a mad, mad middle of the... And she goes, 
did you make it? She, she says, did you make it or did you order it? I said, I ordered it. She goes, never order it. Make it, Tommy. I said, get the fuck up here and make me a curry. And then she starts laughing, yeah? I said, please, please don't do this, man. And then she comes. And then the minute she says she's coming, I then get my mate. I ring my mate in Manchester. It's about 11 o'clock at night. I said, get your wife around here. Because these, all of these girls are... are been through so much man and then she come and stayed the night i said you don't have to talk to us when i was on the phone you don't have to talk to us about it but but no we're working against this gang now and we put the documentaries out the police the police refused to meet us with evidence i had a dossier of evidence you can listen to it police refused to meet us point blank refused i had so much information man but that was uh the rape of britain so the best work i was ever doing was during that censorship and then the film as i said film gets released in america silenced right? silence gets released at a theater with General Flynn, some of the most influential people in, American, in America. General Flynn put out a statement, and do you know what? He said, this is one of the most important films I've watched. This ties it up. We all know the courts are weaponized. This catches how and how and how they operate. So it went out and um, I shit myself. And I fucking shit myself. And I, I had my family come out and see me in Tenerife. And I thought, you know what? Everyone, where is the only place in the world that has protected freedom of speech? It's the United States of America. So I, I thought, I'm going to go to America and I'm going to claim asylum. And that's what I've done at that time. And I've, I've videoed everything. I've documented it. So I kissed my kids goodbye. I said, when I'm safe and in America, you can come. Yeah. But I'm going to, the only place, because I'm, if not, I'm, they're going to lock me up in the UK. So I flew to Cuba. Fucking mental. I flew to Cuba. I spent a week in Cuba. And and, I, what, and in the document, I, I was making a documentary. I thought, let's see how long it, how easy it is to get into the United States illegally. And I thought, they can come and claim asylum. I'll do it. I, I need political asylum. Yeah. And I want a hotel. <laughs> you can pay me money. Yeah. So, but it took me 48 hours to find a route into the United States for $10,000 from the Bahamas. Do you know who the boats are full of? Irish travelers. I swear to fucking God. Irish travelers on boats into America illegally. It's mental for $10,000. But I went to Cuba and then I'm sitting in the Bahamas and I get to the Bahamas. I'm on my own, yeah? But I'm up, but in Cuba, even when I was in Cuba, because if you look, they track me down in, in the police investigation for this case. They pinpoint me in Cuba. They say he was in this hotel in Cuba. Then he was here in the Bahamas. It's like, so fucking what? So you, were you getting charged because it was played in America? Yeah, they, so they, no, they didn't come for me. Yeah, mm. but I expect, I thought they would. So I didn't hear anything. So I think I'm going to go to America and I go to Cuba when I was in Cuba, I'd say visit Cuba, yeah? It's a fascinating place. I know it's a communist shithole, but the people with no money and poverty were so pleasant because on the tourist information, it warns you about everything. Mate, I just went out and partied, yeah? I went out and met, I was in some, um, I was in some, I'll swear to you, I'll, I'll give you the videos, yeah? I was in derelict houses partying with all the Cubans. I had a great time, man. I had a great time, but I was fucking also lost and mental at the same time. I was walking through the middle of it. I had my iPhone out, a Louis Vuitton bag, and everyone's warning you about getting robbed. Mate, I didn't feel any fear there. More fear in Luton. Everyone was so fucking pleasant. Every, they just dance and music all day, and every night on the roundabouts, like they've got nothing. Do you know they queue for days for petrol? For days. There's no petrol. There's, there's these queues. I found the whole place fascinating. Anyway, I go from there to Bahamas. I'm ready to go to America. I meet the lads who have got the boat, the black lads who are doing the boat trips. And then I'm in contact with a lawyer in America about my asylum claim. And then I tell him that I unlawfully entered America before. I got 10 months in jail for it. And he said, well, you're fucked then. Because first time's a misdemeanor. Second time's a felony. You get two years in jail, mate. So I said, fuck. He said, and you can't claim asylum because you're a criminal record. <coughs> he said, you can claim a right to prevention of torture act, which would mean prevent you getting deported, but you'll never be able to leave the United States of America. <coughs> so I don't know. I thought, fuck, what do I do now? Now what do I do? I'm expecting never a one-hour home. So then I end up choosing somewhere else. Um, how do I say as well? Whilst I was in Tenerife, Tenerife's run by some mafia gangsters who are Muslim, who called me on a meeting when I was there as well. I went on the meeting. I said, what's up? We heard you here. I said, yeah, I am here. Here I am. Uh, and, and actually, they were sound, yeah? But they, they, they let me know that they knew stuff about me, had me on surveillance. And so then I thought, right, I'll start somewhere new. So I left again and I started, in, I went to another part of Spain and I was lost again. I say lost, I was fucking, I went there the first three weeks, it rained, man. And I was just on my own, depressed, <coughs> deflated. I'd then go into Benidorm, just go on benders. I was on the sesh, 
Tufty sitting over here. I think he come out and saved me a few times. <coughs> What's that? He come out and saved me and babysit me. And I remember he sat there and he said, yeah, he said, listen to me, right? And we're sitting there and we, we went to the ice cream place the other week. He said, you next year are going to be mainstream again. Forget all this. The country needs your voice. I was sitting there thinking, fuck off, mate. I'm censored. I'm dead. I'm this. I'm that. I'm fucking lost. Man. You're feeling sorry for yourself? <clears throat> totally. And broken. Like lost. Totally. I just want to be out with my kids. All I ever want to do is be with my kids and be with my family. And I'm fucking not. Does it make you question that everything you've done was for, not for no reason, but it just made everything worse because you're obviously doing it for the right reason. Now, anybody who's trying to expose fucking groomers and people who <coughs> abuse kids, anybody who doesn't support that is one themselves in my eyes. So when you're going through all that then, because you're not understanding the duty of care you have a need for these kids mm. and for these women and their parents, you're trying to do the right thing and expose the fucking mass grooming gangs. It's all around. You not don't want to bring it down. In the world, and it feels as if you're banging a, your head against a brick wall. You've broke up with your family. You're bankrupt. You've not got any social media. Was that the lowest point that you'd ever come to in your life? No, that was last week, bruv. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was low, man. It was a low point. And do you know what? And Lee, as I said, tough to come over, took me gym, because I need routine, yeah? And when I get lost, I was lost, man. I was fucking lost. I was in a bad place. I'd still come back and do my work. So to people looking, I'm doing videos, I'm fine, but behind the scenes, I'm fucking a lunatic. <laughs> I'm an absolute lunatic. So I've got all this going on. And then Liam's saying that to me. He said, mate, listen, look, you work, this, this, you've done this. And he said, and he said, read what, like, watch videos yourself. Just look, look what you've been through. Look what you've done. And I started watching things again. And I looked at some things and thought, fuck, man. I don't, like when I was looking at previous uh, videos of myself that had gone out and I didn't believe in myself at that time I didn't believe in myself I was fucked and then I'm sat there and I always still looked on Twitter I always still looked on X and my account popped up and I was like what the fuck because I've been banned from everything and there's my account with 400,000 followers Elon Musk has took over Twitter I'm like, no, nah, that can't be fucking right. I'm back. And then I looked and I saw Katie Hopkins. So I rang up Katie Hopkins and said, you're back on Twitter. So am I. She goes, what? I said, I'm looking at your account on Twitter. It's back. You've got a million followers. She said, really? I said, yeah. So then I looked and then I don't remember any passwords, yeah? So I'm fucked now. I can't get any of my banking apps because every time something happens on my phone, I don't remember any of the passwords. So I've got Twitter back. It's there, but I can't even tweet. So I'm looking and think, fuck, I just want to... And, and that was... Every time, I've been down lots of times, and every time I felt like I'm broken, something's picked me back up. And at that time, that was, boom, get the back, get back up and fucking get back in that fight, yeah? And I got my Twitter back. I went, right, okay. So then I couldn't get into it for two days. And it was all over the news. It, Elon Musk gave Tom Robinson back his Twitter account, but I couldn't tweet. <laughs> I just fucking want to tweet. I'm, I love Twitter. So I'm there, and I've got so much to fucking say. And I come back on, in the end... I get an email, so I reach out to someone who I know is close to Elon Musk, and then I get a personal email just saying, click this button, I click the button, boom, I'm back in. So I think, right, now what? Now I'm going home, right? Now I'm not lost. Now the fight's on. And if you look at where my projection's gone, that's since that moment. So I was down, I was lost, I was out of it. I know what I, know what I need in my life. I need to go to the gym at five o'clock in the morning. I need routine and I need to eat healthy. If I stopped those things, I didn't this morning, went out of full English, yeah? I didn't go for the run, Tufty did, yeah? But I know myself. So I know that if I do those things, I'm flying, yeah? And my head's sharp, I can do anything. But if I don't, and I lose myself, and at times I've lost myself, so that happens. And then I get my account back. So I think, right, I'm going back to the UK, but they're probably going to nick me. Because I haven't been back to the UK at this point for nine months. Yeah, and because, silence has been released. The silence was released in America, but no, it didn't. It didn't get any traction, really. It was released in America. I think two hundred thousand views. Mm. No one spoke about it. No one really saw it. I didn't release it, but the way the injunction, the way the judge said about the injunction, it doesn't matter who released it. You're fucked. This film gets out. You're fucked. And I told him at the time. And I've got actual got recordings of what I told him at the time. I said the film's already in America. How can you hold me? Did your jurisdiction cover the United States of America? He said it doesn't matter. You need to go look at legal advice. So I thought they'll find a way to hook it on me, which they have anyway. So I don't receive anything. I go back. I get back to the UK. I don't get arrested. I'm not fucking ill. And I'm, I'm back in the UK. So I'm, I'm working on the rape of Britain. The next episode still. Yes, yeah? so I'm going through the rape of Britain. But now I've got a platform to put them on. 
And, that, and then I'm building my Twitter and my Twitter just went boom, through the roof. And then we're watching as October 7th launches. Now, I, ha I didn't have my account back when October 7th launched. And I made a video walking along the beach near Alicante, ranting, saying to all you fucking idiots, do you understand who Hamas are? They are ISIS, you morons, yeah? We're in fucking Hamas. They're governed by Hamas. They elected Hamas. So I went on this rant and someone else put it on Twitter and it was on 2 million views. So I thought the politics, because no one was really saying, I think I, I say things that many people are thinking that want to say, but think they'll lose their job or get a violent reaction if they do say it. So I go back. I don't get arrested. My account's back. And then I watch and see um, October 7th happens. And then I see all the Hamas rallies in London. And I see them taking the fucking piss left right and center i see the police running away i see them standing there with isis flags Al um hamas flags calling for jihad literally terrorist organizations his butt here are prescribed terrorist organizations in most nations especially in the united arab emirates any muslim nation that wants to control their people know they have to ban these fuckers because they're extreme bastards in england they're in every university yeah they weren't banned now They've been banned since October 7th. But why did it take you 20 years? We were warning about this group for fucking decades. Why have you never listened? But this group have been radicalising. They're then standing on the streets of London calling for Muslim armies, for jihad. I'm watching it all thinking, how the fuck? We've got all these hate speech laws, but they're only directed one way. These fucking, these lot can say what they want. They're calling for jihad. They're calling for the gas and the Jews. They're literally supporting terrorist organisations, which is a 14-year prison sentence, and nothing's happening. Is this what you talk about with two-tier policing? This was, yeah, so I, two, this is two-tier, but the country got to see two-tier policing because of this. Two-tier policing has come part of British vocabulary now, but I'd seen it. I first spoke about it in 2004 in leaflets so on my front page, the main month front page of my newspaper. I was talking about how come you don't police them the same? Yeah, how come it's kid gloves for them and iron fist for us? What's going on? So, but the whole country got to watch it, and then they made a this fucking Islamist scumbag made a statement saying that on Armitage Day there will be no silence. So then, bearing in mind I've organised no protests and done no demonstrations, I made a video and said, "Well, you know what? You ain't getting nowhere near the cenotaph on Armitage Day because every lad in England's going to turn up." So lads. Let's get our asses to London and let's shut because And the problem being, I wish you could just rely on, rely on the police, but what we'd witnessed in weeks prior was them burning flags, climbing up our war memorials, desecrating them, and the police standing by. All right, lads, do you want to hand down? Police doing nothing, literally doing nothing. They literally stood by and watched as terrorists marched through our capital, inciting hate, desecrating war memorials. So I watched that, made a ranting video, as usual, a bit passionate, saying, well, you ain't, I, I, you're going to get met. If you come near that cenotaph, on armour to say, there's going to be an army waiting for you. And then I received a letter, my solicitors received a letter from the Attorney General about the film <laughs> that was released two years prior. But the, the film was, threat it was threatening me. It said, we are contemplating prosecuting you for contempt of court. It, I believe that they were warning me, don't go through with this fucking demonstration. So I made a video saying, Mr. Attorney, Gen Attorney General, you can go and fuck yourself. Yeah. At this point, I'm now back in the game. Yeah. Because whatever you do to me, I'm going to show the world. I'm now back. I have a voice again. Yeah. My voice is going through the roof. It's a well. If I look now, my, in the last three months, I looked yesterday. 1.7 billion people has been my reach. The video. The, well, I'll have a look now because it's fun to look because it pisses everyone off. So the groups. What well, for the for the establishment for the hope not hate for the NGOs for the anti-racist organisations that have tried to silence us for years. My voice is louder than it's ever fucking been. <laughs> Which must really piss you lot off. I'll go to profile. You remember how to get to the uh, premium. So when we go to reach, yeah, analytics. Let's have a look in the last three months. In the last three months, 350 million people have watched our videos. 300, yeah. 1.5 million people have replied. My new followers is half a million in three months. The impressions, 1.7 billion. Profile visits, 7.4 million. Eat your fucking heart out. We are back with a bat. And not just are we back, but the public are listening. So we, but anyway, I've done Armitage Day rally. They threatened to, threatened to issue court proceedings against me. They didn't. i done the rally. I, I went. And the thing is, Mayor Tusi, this is where Mayor General called Mayor Tusi, conservative reporter, Iranian. I'd, I'd been watching him. Very good. I, thought he's, I think he's brilliant, actually. I think he's the best newcomer for Britain, British politics there is. I think he's got the best future as well. So I'd watched him 
And he live streamed everything with me that day. And I turned up very politely to the police and said, we're just here for the two minute silence, lads. Yeah. And then they were blocking everything. I said, lads, where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do? I didn't argue with anyone, but the media told media and the news said I was there aggressively, but half a million people had watched live on his channel. So this is the half a million people going, no, he didn't do that. That's a lie. Yeah. So people are seeing their lies and now I've got my social media to share their lies. So I can now count because you know how frustrating it is for five years to sit and watch everyone lie about you and say you've done something you haven't. And then uh, I watch on news where they said I was throwing rocks at police. One presenter said I threw rocks at police in Armitage State. It's like, I was calm. I stayed for the two minute silence. The minute it was done, I got in a taxi and left, which they tried making a deal of that. So that was the start of it. Then I went to a report on an anti-Semitism rally. Um, I turned up as a journalist again, because I'm back doing my journalism. I turned up to report on the largest anti-Semitism rally there's been. And the police come in and said, you need to leave the city your presence here could cause alarm and distress. I said, my presence? Hamas have took over our capital city every week for the last fucking six months, you mugs. You've been running away from them. Said, well, do you don't think that's caused our entire country alarm and distress? Your failures are causing us alarm and distress. I, 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 and I went outside and said, has anyone got a problem with me being here? And everyone was like, we, we want you here, Tommy. Yeah. And I think the problem was the establishment, as in Boris Johnson and these sorts of figures, were at that same rally and they didn't want me to receive a great reception at a rally that they're part of because that's the reception I've received. So the police come in heavy handed, they handcuff me, they pepper spray me from point blank range and then they prosecute me. And when they prosecute me, it become what, apparent why. As I got out, was getting released, they gave me bail conditions not to enter London. So for six months, I was banned from the capital city and not to organise protests. So for six months, because they, they were looking at the situation, the wars kicked off in Israel, terrorists had taken over the cities and universities. If there's one person that's going to mobilise any resistance to it, who is it going to be? It's going to be him. Let's just put a fabricated charge on him, which they did. And they prosecuted me under it. And um, I won the case. The judge found that everything they'd done was unlawful. Bail conditions are unlawful. They lied the whole way through it. And I, and I, was, I was cleared. And that was the start then of um, then the summer of protests, which we started organising our protests and, and doing our work. And I, I made a documentary called Lawfare, put out on the 1st of June, and it, it had 6 million views. So, do you know, when you're creating content, I just wish that I'd have had that to show the rape of Britain because it would have had 6 million views or 8 million views and we went from 6 million views to them so why can't you show that now I can now but the, the, the momentum so the momentum of the street protest went from Armitage Day to then saying I looked and thought we've been downtrodden we've been beaten down we've been made to feel embarrassed of who we are we're, our culture's under attack what can we do to bring that together so we said we called it Uniting the Kingdom and on June the 30th, was it? June the 1st of June? 1st of June. On the 1st of June, we decided to have a rally. And in that rally, we decided to get women to sing. We had a patriotic gathering and it was beautiful. And, and we had rules, no masks, no face coverings, no, no drinking excessively. We're here to celebrate our identity. And it was a massive success. And everyone who went, went away feeling part, of feeling a community again and a sense of identity, which we'd lost. And it was a symbol that London's ours again because London's just been a terrorist shithole for the last six months. They've took over every Saturday. Well, not this Saturday. 30,000 turned up, which is large numbers for any sort of our gathering. It's the biggest numbers I've ever um, mobilised. But there's a reason for that. The public are feeling it. They, they're awake. So we went on from that to then doing it on the 27th of July. And at that point then, between that, between the first one, then they hit me with, um, we're prosecuting you for contempt of court. So they contact my solicitors and said, we're starting legal proceedings for, do I have any, anything to say? So I sent back a legal letter saying, yeah, I didn't release the film, but they're prosecuting me anyway. And when they prosecute me, so Jam Jamal, the Syrian refugee, he didn't want me prosecuted because I've got the paperwork. His lawyers haven't asked for me to be prosecuted. The attorney general is who's prosecuting me. So it's the government. So I'm going, I'm being charged by the government to go before the high court of London before a judge with no jury where I can face two years in prison. So 27th of July comes and I spoke to my family and said, I should have owned this. I should have owned it three years ago. I should have showed the world three years ago. I have got something in my locker that will show the public their deceit, their lies, their corruption. I've got an opportunity. And I said to many of the people who told me not to, in fact, everyone around me told me not to. I said on the 27th of July, when we've got a million people watching live in front of an audience of the biggest gathering of British Patriots has ever been, I'm playing that fucking film. 
And then I stood up. So I stood up. And then this is what I now face prison for. But sometimes doing the right thing is doing the wrong thing, unfortunately. And that's in the eyes of, so this is my, this is my statement to the court. Because I might not get to see this, which I stand trial for on the 28th of this month. I, I believe I'll be, I believe I'll be remanded when I land. But I believe in freedom of speech and freedom of the press. My duty as a journalist is to uncover the truth. And I've worked for years to shine a light and challenges in society that no one else is willing to speak about. Have you watched the documentary yet, Your Honour? Because if you fucking have, what am I doing here? Yeah. If you have watched the film Silence, Your Honour, you will have seen that I didn't make accusations and I didn't make assumptions in the film. I let witnesses give their testimonies and said that Jamal, in his right to reply, denies all of the accusations against him. I explained that Justice Hickson's verdict and I explained that I lost the case. There was nothing else I could have concluded because Jamal didn't bring any evidence to court. He didn't bring anyone to court to speak up for him apart from his father, Jihad. No teachers, no social workers, no friends. What's the impact of this verdict? Justice Nixon's verdict in this case is extraordinary. And while the case caused my divorce and bankruptcy, far more important is the impact this verdict had on, the, on, on those courageous children who came to court to testify in my defence. Justice Nixon effectively disregarded their testimonies. He said he didn't know why they were lying, but called them all liars nevertheless. Charlie, a grade A student, didn't even like me or support me, but was courageous enough to come to court and testify. She had a breakdown. She had to be sectioned. Justice Nicklin, you caused this. Bailey McLaren had tried to commit suicide. Thankfully, thankfully, now he's started to rebuild his life. He's overcome the lie that he is a racist. Many others have been affected. The collateral damage of this scandalous verdict is too great for the public not to know the truth. The balanced account of the case. Some people still believe the legacy media is there to report what is happening. The truth rather than push strongly biased accounts driven by ideology or political agendas. Well, in this case, the press only attended court on the day that Jamal and his father gave it. The press only turned up. When Jamal gave evidence, the press were there. When our witnesses got up, all the press left court. They didn't report. So the public were never given the accounts of the five children. They left court. I stood there, looked at the judge and went, what the fuck? I said, really? So no one outside is going to know what's being said in here? So justice banned me from present. Justice Nicklin banned me from presenting the same evidence that was presented in court. If it's such a clear-cut case, why is this necessary to hide the facts from the public? If they watch the testimonies of the witnesses, they would surely come to the same conclusion as Justice Nicklin. What is the agenda? Well, the injunction was apparently to protect Jamal's reputation. Yet it's not the reputation of Jamal that has been damaged by this legal circus. I don't wish any ill for Jamal. I personally think he was a victim of his own predatory lawyers and those who bl blasted this story around the world for their own purposes and agendas. It's very telling that Jamal hasn't asked me to be prosecuted in this case, neither of his lawyers. This case has been brought against me by the Attorney General, by the British government. In my view, there are similarities with the post office ca case. Powerful interests hiding the truth for their own purposes, regardless of the terrible consequences for those innocent children I have mentioned and others. So if you're asking me whether I plead guilty or not guilty, yes, Your Honour, I am guilty of showing the film in Trafalgar Square on the 27th of July. I made the decision to play this film. I am grateful to Elon Musk and X for allowing the film to remain available, for standing for freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. Although not for you, Your Honour, nor for your court, nor for the entire justice system. I do have total contempt for Justice Nicklin's ruling and his attempt to hide the truth from the public. Justice Nicklin fell out of his own father before the case, arguing about me. He should have recused himself from the case ever, be ever began. The world is watching. I stand for truth. I stand for freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And that puts me on the wrong side of Justice Nicklin's injunction. Then so be it. If I have to sit in a prison cell for speaking the truth, well, I'm just one of many people right now that this government is imprisoning, imprisoning for the things they say political prisoners. If I have to sit in jail for refusing to be silenced, I'm prepared for that. I say I'm prepared for it, but I've torn myself mentally for fucking months over it. Do you know what I mean? Even recently as in the last coming weeks, because it is, uh, what do I face? I face prison. I face possible death attempts on my life. I've had it before. I was locked in. They, they locked me in a room with Muslims in Woodhill. I lost all my teeth. That's why I've got these beautiful gnashes. <laughs> so you're getting two years. I faced two, for I faced two years. For revealing this documentary that you believe was all lies and all a cover up and to discredit you. It just seems a bit extreme for something. Well, what they've done, no, not just two years. That, so where it was leaked in America, they've took that case and seven interviews I gave where all I said in the interviews is this child said this. I just gave the testimonies of the children. So that, that's one they've charged me of contempt there. When I played the film on the 27th, this is what fried my head because I knew I'd get to, I was looking at two years. When I played the film on the 27th, they've gone, fuck you, separate case. So Melissa, Melissa said they haven't put them together. So he can now sentence you to two years for that and two years for that. So you're looking at four years, Steve. And that's why I was like, fucking hell, man. Because 
I challenge anyone. Go sit, get your bedroom, put a little blue mat in it, and go sit on that blue mat for the next seven days. And for 30 minutes a day, come out of that room and walk around in a square no bigger than this lounge. And then see how you feel. Because a day is like a week, man. And a week is like a month. And they know that. And the days become, you don't know. When I was, I remember when I was on solitary, I've, I've done a year of solitary. And it fucked me, man. But when I was on solitary, you fall asleep. You don't know what day or the time it is. You've got no idea whether it's night, when it was, it's a winter. I feel I don't even know if it's two in the morning or fucking eight in the morning. I've got no idea what the time is. There's no clock. I've got nothing. So I know what it was like before, but I also, I am that fucking bitter and stubborn stubborn that I want to throw myself into that situation. That's why I'm going back. They can't even extradite me on this charge. They can't. I think you're, you're not putting me on trial. I'm putting you on trial. 52, 53 million people have watched that film. You think I'm on trial. It's your reputation, not mine. Everyone who's watched that film knows I told the truth. I honored, I have told the truth. What am I guilty of is journalism and telling the public the truth. I'm guilty of letting them know your bullshit and lies. And if you want to send me to prison for that, it does, it does damage me. It damages me mentally. It damages me fit, probably physically. It damages my family. But it damages fucking you. It damages your reputation, your judiciary. It lets the world know that you corrupt, that you, you weaponize. And do you know what? Since I went, since the 7th, 27th of July, what has the whole world watched? The weaponization of our judiciary. The, the Muslims who battered the coppers at Manchester Police Station haven't even been charged. The Hare Hill rioters, only four of them got done. British people are rounding up. Hundreds, a thousand of them are in prison for fucking words. You locked them up. So when you want to, so you didn't want to with the grooming gangs. It takes you years to prosecute them. Rapists, paedophiles, they get let off. But anyone who went against your government, your communist, tyrannical government, Keir Starmer, you locked up. Pensioners, women, a 12-year-old child. Do you know they're locked up a 12-year-old girl? They're prison a 12-year-old girl. You fucking scumbags, man. So you scumbags. People will ask the question, though, because you know you're getting a sentence from that. You know it's life or death inside yeah. that prison cell where it's you need to get into a fucking solitary confinement. You know yourself, one hour away from life, one hour away from your phone can knock you fucking do that. You're willing to go to prison and you knew by releasing that it was going to happen. So why release it? A multitude of reasons. It clears Bailey's name. Let me see if I, I ain't got the English phone. He, he messaged me. He messaged me saying, mate, everyone's apologising to me in his hometown. He couldn't walk the streets of his hometown. He couldn't walk the fucking streets. He was a kid. So it clears Bailey's name. It clears all those children's names. It shows that they told the truth. It shows the courage that they showed. And the fact I'm a stubborn little bastard, yeah? The fact that I'm not letting you win. And the fact that you get to hear my story, yeah? I've got a profile. You're going to hear my story. What about the men that are in jail now since these riots? What about the men that are getting battered by Muslim gangs? Because they are. I've spoke to their families. I've got the recordings of them from the families crying. What about all those men? You're not even hearing their stories. So the weaponization of the judiciary is something that needs to be tore down. It needs to be of public knowledge that the courts are not there for justice. They're there as a weapon. So it, when you have a totalitarian state, which is what we live under, the judiciary and the facade of, of, of equality and justice are just exactly that, they're facades. And they're weapons that they can turn on like that. And when they want to turn on someone, like me, for reporting the truth, they'll use contempt of court where there's no jury. So I've never been tried by a jury. I'm not fucking perfect. I'm not innocent in everything I've ever done, yeah? Mm -hmm. But I've never been tried by a jury. Why not? We're meant to be living in a, in, a, in a fair just society where 12 members of the British public decide my fate rather than an appointed judge. An appointed judge like Justice Nicklin, who's got no kids, who's never had a missus, a bit weird, yeah? What have they got on him? What have they got on him? Because he's going to fuck, because he fucked me. He went against seven, he went against every bit. Watch the film. He went against every single bit of evidence and ruled against me. Because the purpose of that case was to bankrupt me. And it worked. It caused my divorce. It w the purpose of all of this was to break me. And I played recently a message from my mum. And at times I've been broken. At times people say, how the fuck do you deal with that pressure? I don't at times. But I get back up and fight. Can and you not get an appeal for the silence movie? Can you not get an appeal of the sentence? No. Well, could, no. Could, as I said, it cost... It, it, mate, at the end of that court case, it's the highest court before the highest judge. I was fucked. I was so drained, bruv. 
I'd spent £100,000 and then they bankrupt me. So they cleared me, bankrupt me. I just got divorced. I went into rehab and I left the country and I didn't know what to do with myself, man. And But I can now. Do you know, do you know what's happened this week? So I'm crowdfunding to get the best representation. They've closed our banks. They've froze our money. I've got no money. I can't pay lawyers. I can't, so this again, every bank's closed me down personally. I work for a company called Urban Scoop. What they've done in the last three weeks, crowdfunding is coming in to pay for my legal bills. Boom, they closed the account. They closed the account and said, we'll only transfer the money. So then, with, and I've got all this to show the judge. So he said, transfer the money to the lawyer, straight to the lawyer. No, they won't. So Tide, the bank company, won't. So then they set up another, they said, we'll only send it to another bank account in a, the same company name. So then Urban Scoop set up another company, bank account, online bank account. They, the money was pending for seven days. And then the new bank, we're not banking you either. Literally no bank in the UK will bank us. None. And the money's just sat there. And they won't let us access it. So I'm going to court next week. I'm going to be probably getting remanded next week. Have a bail hearing. I've got no fucking money. We've, got no, we've, we've raised money to fight, but they won't even let us access it. So, and that's everything. So even, even that, it's fucking just, it's tyranny. It's total tyranny. Every, every to have a fair fight. I, I'm lucky. You no know Ezra Levant. I used to work for Ezra. He runs Rebel Media. I've been at back and forward. In fact, he just messaged me while we're sat here. I, I messaged him and he, and I said, mate, what the fuck am I meant to do? Yeah. I've got no lawyers. I'm fucked. P.S. I booked a hotel a week ago. Thanks. Yes. I landed in Anacandy, 11.15. Okay. He's, so, he, so Ezra's on his way here. So Ezra said, I'm going to get your legals covered, Tommy. Yeah? I'm going to sort it out. So he's coming to sort it out, thankfully. I don't know how he's going to sort it out because it's about 100 grand. It's what, about... <laughs> what would happen if you didn't pay? If it doesn't pay, I'll go to court. I'm going to go before a judge next week. And what am I going to do? He's just going to send me to jail. Nobody to fight your corner. No, I want to fight my corner. Because they never give me... See, even this injunction they keep talking about, they never served me an injunction. They emailed me it. Well, I've done my own research and I spent £10,000 six weeks ago when we had money. I spent £10,000 for a KC to look at it and he said, no, you're right. They haven't given you an injunction because email doesn't constitute service of an injunction. They have to have a process. Yeah, up. hand it over to you. They hand it over to you. Yeah. But they've never handed it to me. They've never handed it to me. So you haven't even got an injunction, you mugs. But who's, whose decision is that down to? The judge. Justice Nickman's mate. We'll soon see. So that's our first argument. Our first argument is that. Now, am I guilty of playing the film? Yeah, I am, yeah. <coughs> Do I apologise for it? No, I don't. Not at all. Not one single fucking shred of me. I apologise for what I'm about to go through. To myself, I apologise to my kids, to my family. I'm gutted about them coming to prisons and that again for however long, which could be years. But do I regret playing the film? Not one single fucking bit. And that film is now, if you want to talk about corrupt media, that has had 53 million views and not one single British journalist has, journalist has commented on it. Not one. Alex Phillips was the first journalist yesterday. To, I said, why do you think you're the first? She said, because it is scary to me. What's going to happen to me for talking about it? People lose their jobs. But, so we don't live in a free society. Yeah, but don't. Never there is have. No, no, yeah. There is no free press. There is no, there is, and when someone comes along who's a journalist that's uncontrollable, who thanks to Elon Musk, like I made a video yesterday where I was laughing, I was walking along the beach with Liam, yeah? I said, watch this. And I give people a six minute rant to why you need to be in London on, on October 26th and why you need to behave. I don't know when this is going out. They want you to riot. Don't riot. I was young. Right? I've learned a lot. Don't cover your face. That's what they want. Cut, be calm. Bring a smile. Bring a celebration. We've got a lot to celebrate because we've come a long way. The, world, the, the world's watching. <clears throat> on October 26th, the world is watching London. Yeah? We have a worldwide audience who are watching our government. They're watching the courts. They're watching the justice system. <clears throat> and I'll come out of jail said like Justice Nicklin I'd love if he was in court I'd say Justice Nicklin like you thought you'd be remembered in history as the lead senior judge of media in the High Court of London you're going to be remembered as a corrupt fraud mate I'm not you are <coughs> you handed down that Germany handed down the verdict well you have to go to court to get the verdict so but you have to give the names of who's coming to court so all the witnesses which were the children and their families because it was COVID they all give their names he bottled it, bruv. He cancelled the court case. He said he was ill. And he'd done it via video link, which is why he's never given me a pro why I've never been given the injunction. Because he'd done it over the video. Because he didn't have the fucking bottle to sit there in front of those six five children and their mothers and fathers who had done the right thing. What is it? They've done the right thing. They've come to court and they've testified and told the truth. And you found that every single one of them, for no reason at all, were lying. 
It's just the whole the whole thing. But again, no media will report on it. But they don't, the media don't remember matter so much anymore. In the words of Mayor Tusi, we are the media now. We're the media. This is the media, James. Yeah, I believe so. But remember, they can control the narrative through your radio, your TV, your newspapers, magazines. It's all changed. They they don't everything. But now, if you looked at podcasts, it was all, all everyone was independent. Now they're all BBC. Now it's yeah. all celebrities. Now it's all people getting paid to then push their own agenda. It's That's monopoly. fucking be getting controlled now. Yeah. Um, but that is what it is. So when you you accept that, bang, you're guilty. You accept that. What well, about no, the? No, I accept. I accept. I'm guilty of of July 27th. So that's a two year sentence. Mm -hmm. I, I accept that. Yeah. I, I made the conscious decision to play the film and say this is. Yeah, me. you accept that. Fuck you. What about the UK riots when they say you're at the forefront and you're instigated is every it, riot in the UK? Bruv, totally insanity. Because I was. I, I made a video again. Luckily, because if it didn't, it had eight million views on X. I made a video saying, let's see what I said about the riots. And I put together everything from the start of the riots. And it's me saying, stop fucking burning shit, you weirdos. Stop attacking police. You see those police officers? They're out on the front. Everything I said is the total opposite of what the media said. There's no evidence. Use chat GTP. Yeah? Use, use AI and say, did Tommy Robinson instigate? And I never once claimed it was a Muslim. I never once claimed it was a sign seeker. I didn't. Nigel Farage did. Certain people did. I didn't. Yeah, Never once. So there's no truth at all in the fact that I instigated any riots. And do you know when they tracked me down, those journalists? I was on holiday. And I knew this was coming, this prison sentence, yeah? So from my head, I think I need to see my kids. And I booked it a year before. And the last holiday, I ended up in Belmarsh. The time before that, I went to Mexico, landed at the border with my kids, and they detained me and arrested me. Said I was, the British had told them to arrest me. So that holiday was ruined. So this, this time, I thought, right, two weeks for the kids, man. And it's my last two weeks to have a proper time with them before I go to jail. So I'm there two days. Bang, front page of all the newspapers. Instigating riots from his sunbed. And do you know what they used to say my controversial tweet was mass deportations needed? It's not controversial. Mass deportations are needed. We've got 750,000 illegal migrants that are in our country. It shouldn't be there. We need to deport them. I'd empty every hotel. Every one of those hotels full of men, not women and children. This would be a different ball game if it was women and children. Full of fighting age, Muslim men would be on fucking planes tomorrow if I had my way. I'd get rid of every one of them. So mass deportations needed is not a controversial tweet. That's not instigating riots. Keir Starmer instigated the riots. <laughs> Keir Starmer pulled petrol on it. He inflamed it massively. He had an opportunity to come out and say, we understand your anger. It, it went mental from when he made his attack. You're all far right. You're all this. He actually says, I don't care. Because watch our film anyway. Watch our film on 26th of October. And I sat away, sort of, how do I punch back? And, I, and again, I come out here. I come away. I left the country on 27th of July. Went to have my two-week holiday. They, they ruined it. They doxed the address of the hotel where I was with my kids. I, lo I was there two days, man. And then Sky turned up, BBC turned up, um, all these different news crews turned up. The manager comes see me and say, can you just wait in your room? There's, there's film crews all over our hotel. So I'm sitting in the room, they're videoing my kids. And I, my, and I, I went with four families. So my kids, I, I didn't want to ruin my kids' holiday. So I said, kids, I spoke to the other families because they said, can the kids just stay with you? So they still get their holiday. I don't want to be the cause of ruining their fucking holiday. So they said, yeah. So I flew to Greece. I flew to Greece. And I knew the three, three film crews that were there I flew to Greece and I'd done a video outside a restaurant with the name of the road in the background purposely because I knew they'd track it down. And then I messaged all the journalists that were in Greece, that were in, um, that were in Cyprus. I said, I'll do interviews with all of you, but you have to fly to Greece. I flew all of them to fucking Greece. <laughs> I flew all of them and I messaged, and then I said, but I, I, and I got them there in the morning. I said, 9 p.m., lads. And then they messaged me at 9 p.m. I said, I'm caught up a little while, I'll be another hour. So they're waiting and I said, I made them book, a, book me a suite. At some big, big hotel. I said, book me a suite if you want me to do the interviews and we'll do the interviews in the suite and we'll set it all up. And then when he messaged me, uh, and then he said, Tommy, where are you? I said, you fucking wankers, yeah? You fucking wankers. And, and but I was sat in Spain at that time. But he got, I sent cameramen straight away. I sent my cameras, my surveillance teams that we use to picture their families. And I sent them pictures. So the journalist that docks my family, that put pictures of my family in a national newspaper, I sent him personally on his mobile a picture of his kids coming out of his house the next day and his wife. I said, is it fair? I just asked, and then I rang him and fucking went mad at him. I said, is it fair? I would never share those photos, yeah? But I wanted him to fit. I said, is it fair if I share these pictures of your fucking family? Is it fair? What have they got to do with it? You, you could have run your story about me without picturing my family or giving the location of where my kids are. You know now I know where you live. 
and you not and I will come and find you with a camera and talk to you because you fret you put you endangered my kids. You didn't have to do that. But again, the newspaper are used as a weapon. The media are a weapon. So uh, we've just held a hundred thousand celebration. We've had a massive rally. Stick the riots on me, basically. That's what the, the plan. Put the riots on me. And they used the media, they used Piers Morgan, they used all their agendas to throw and convince the British public that I caused the riots. The only problem is, I've got X. So Why Piers Morgan not let you have, keep going for a debate? Because he's a pussy. But he's had if you, he, he, he's Andrew in, Tate. He's, he's, had, he's in the film Silenced. He's, he's in the film Silenced. He doesn't come across as a journalist. He didn't investigate. He encouraged for vigilante attacks against a 15-year-old child. And we track him down. So he gets tracked down and questioned for, on the documentary. So it doesn't look good for him at all. So Piers is a coward. And if I went on with him, like when I went on with him last time, he can't win the argument or the debate. He's so far detached. All of these people, these elitists, these 1%, they don't give a shit. None of them care. None of them care. What about Jordan Peterson? I know you've done a podcast with him, nearly 5 million viewers, it got demonetised. You've done another one. How did that relationship start? Um, it started, you know, which I admire Jordan Peterson. I've admired him anyway. I admire anyone who stands against the grain and speaks out. I admire some people who are on the other side of politics because I, I know when they, what they're saying they believe so much. Yeah? But for Jordan Peterson to take the risk to sit down with me and give me the opportunity to talk, I'll be, be forever grateful to him. And the, the relationship came about from his wife. I think his wife had watched and listened to everything. She was shocked by the grooming scandal. She'd followed my interview. So anyone who listens to what I'm saying, not what the media is saying, what I'm saying, realises, yes, I'm not perfect, but I'm not the person they portray me as. Yeah? I believe in what I say. I love my country. I love my kids. And I want what's best for Great Britain. So I was in, I flew to, I flew to um, Canada and I flew to, do you remember Rafe Badawi? Yeah. Rafe Badawi was a Saudi blogger. Yeah, but where is he now? He's off the scene, aren't he? No. So, yeah, Saudi blogger. They give him 10 years. So, oh, is he to go end up in the jail? They jailed him in Saudi Arabia. Hmm. So what he said is Muslims, Christians and Jews are equal. Yeah? You can't say that in Saudi Arabia. You see, Islam doesn't allow that. Yeah. So they arrested him, sentenced him to 10 years imprisonment and a thousand lashes. But there were calls to charge... He got a thousand lashes. There were calls to charge him for blasphemy. Now, when Rafe was in jail, I looked at the case. Rafe had three children. Same age as my children. And I contacted him. I attempted to contact the campaign and I contacted the family. And for the last 10 years, I've kept, I've kept in contact with his wife and his children. And so I thought, right, I'm going to go to Canada. I want, I want to go to Canada. I want to meet the family. Um, Rafe has been released, but he's been put on a travel ban. By, so so they sent, he spends 10 years in jail on solitary confinement for saying Muslims, Jews and Christians are equal. No one really gives a shit. Mental, isn't it? His family get... His family were in Lebanon and then they got refugee status in Canada. So I wanted to go to Canada to meet the family and do a video and talk to the family. about. And the young boy, do you know, like, I know Rafe hasn't been with his family, but his, his children are beautiful, educated, smart. It, he, their mum has done a fabulous job on those three kids as a, as a single parent. And I can see the son, the son wants to go into politics. I think he'll be a lead politician. He's brilliant, man. Tyrat, he's brilliant. So I, I went there to see them. And at the same time, I was going there. So I went to meet them. And then I was, I was arrested, weren't I? They swooped on me. I'd done a little talk with Ezra Levant and, and Rebel Media. And from nowhere, the fucking immigration office come and swooped in cars and arrested me. And it's like, and they give me a ban. I wasn't allowed to leave the, the city of Alberta, was I in Alberta? Or Edmonton? I wasn't allowed to leave the city. And then there was uproar in Canada by Canadians, like Jordan Peterson. I said, hold on a minute. Our borders are open, like our country. He's a journalist. I got through immigration. I had a three, three to four hour interview in immigration. So I'm there legally. I'm in the country. Why are you nicking me? And they nicked me to basically prevent me going to any other cities. So Jordan Peterson put a statement up saying, if you're stopping him coming to other cities, I'm going to travel there. I'm going to interview him. And that's what started it. He said he's going to come and interview me. He wasn't happy at the attempt by the government to silence anyone. So he wanted to come and interview me about what it was about. Then Ezra, the vamp, my old boss, got the best lawyers you could get. And then we went into negotiations with the police and what very quickly realised is they couldn't make me leave once I was there. And I realised that. So they said, right, we'll give you... Because they took my passport. So I didn't want to make... It was my daughter's birthday. So I was worried about that. I thought, I need to be home next week. But they took my passport. But I didn't want them... I didn't want them to let them know that that was a problem. So I just sat and said, man, I'm quite happy here, lads. I'll stay in Alberta. Everyone can come to me. They said, well, when are you going to leave? I said, I don't know. Not bothered. Not really that bothered. And then they wanted me to leave. 
So then in, in the negotiations with the lawyers, it would have took them weeks and weeks or even months to get us through the courts. So in the negotiation, because of the backlog of all the immigration. So in the negotiation with the lawyers, they said, if you, we, uh, we put forward a deal, say, let me fly to Toronto, let me spend two days there, or one day, to I had a talking event and I had a Jordan Peterson interview, and I will leave, we'll book the flights, we booked all the flights, Ezra did, with the lawyers, and said, there you go, that's our, that's our offer. It'll be gone in three days. If not, he's going to be here months and it's going to be a total clown show, the circus, because everyone's going to be coming to interview him in the hotel. And they agreed it. They said, okay, just go. So then I booked a flight to Toronto. I gave a, I gave a, I spoke at a sold out an event that Ezra had organised. And then I've done the Jordan Peterson interview. And yeah, it went to 4 million people. And you know, for me, it's like my, I looked at my Oxford Union yesterday, it's at 4.6 million views. For me, well, you can't read the comments anymore on Jordan Peterson's one because YouTube blocked it. But for me, people have a preconceived idea of who I am and what I represent and, and what I stand for. So any opportunity I get, I feel like I'm constantly clearing my name. And I'm honest. It's like, no, I'm not perfect. Of course I'm not. Yeah. But it, it was never going to be a female doctor or a fucking scientist that stood up against Islam in Great Britain. So what I've gone through and the fact that I haven't stopped or backed down is due to my upbringing anyway. I'm brought, I'm brought up in a tough town in Luton. I had a a street level upbringing on the streets. So the first punch in the nose didn't stop me. But the, you have to take the, the flaws, the positives with the negatives. It's mm -hmm. like, look, I'm not. And it's like, I wish, I wish it was someone who went to Oxford and Cambridge that stood up to Islam. I wish someone who, who had, that, had the education and spoke in the right way and had the right support, and financial support, led the charge against what's happening in our country. But unfortunately, none of them have. Let's talk about Islam because it's important because I know many Muslim brothers and sisters who are the best on the planet, amazing people, friendly. So do I. And so do you. I was so just about I. to say that. So do you. So how, like when you talk about it and expose it, we can't talk about every Muslim. It's we can't talk about every Christian. So I know it's difficult, especially with the things that you've seen, the grooming gangs and the stuff that you went through, but threatening your family and threatening your kids, you're going to fucking hate no but Muslims but Muslims per se are very good in front of my family yeah I, like, like, but for the Muslim community like because in every religion I'm not a religious man but yeah. every religion there's good and bad and some religions don't make people become who they are I believe people are already bad maybe certain things can then guide them but yeah I believe what, no I don't how, so what's your opinion so on opinion Islam is, just some set the record straight people would have seen lots of videos of me online being confronted by Muslims yeah it's very rare the vast majority of Muslims are very polite to me. And in fact, every time I'm with my children, I've seen lots of them, groups of them who could have given me a hard time. They're very respectful in front of my kids. Always happen. Tell me I don't like you, but I haven't shaken my hand. I don't like you, but I respect you. Yeah? I respect your stance that you stand up for what you believe in, but I don't like you. And then I have many of them pleading with me. So tell me, man, like, bruv, look, we're not bad. We're not like, that. I said, you, we have to get past the mindset. If you're sitting there and you've got a Muslim friend who's a nice, who runs a local kebab shop, he might be a lovely bloke. That's not because he follows Islam. It's because he's a lovely bloke. My, I, I separate Islam from Muslims. People say, how do you do that? What's well, the difference? Well, you can hate, you can, you can criticise the Bible and Jesus without hating every Christian, can't you? Mm -hmm. You're just known as an atheist. So why can't I do that with the Quran? Why can't I look at the life of Muhammad and think he was a horrible fucking bastard and pick, pick fault with him? Why can't I do that? That doesn't mean I hate every Muslim. So I say to my Muslim mates, I say, brother, I don't hate you. I love you. But I don't think that Islam is good for Great Britain. In fact, I know it's not. In fact, Islam has never, never, ever peacefully coexisted. Islam, in the words of Winston Churchill, will bring Europe back to the Dark Ages. It has the power to bring Europe back to the Dark Ages. Does anyone see it, it, it working in any European nation? Where is it working? <laughs> Where? It's not going to work. I know that. I know that from looking at the history of Islam. We've got 1,400 years of history to look at and learn and 45 countries are subjects to look that have been dominated. When it gets to a certain percent, it will dominate, take over and subjugate non-Muslims. And then we're fucked. So do you want to play an experiment? People say, well, it might be different in Great Britain. Well, I'm not willing to play lottery with fucking my the future of this nation with 1,000 years of, of Christian history. I'm not willing to. And I don't think any of us should be. That doesn't mean every Muslim is a problem. I think Muslims are victims of Islam. They're born into something. Many of them don't even believe in it. And they can't even say they're not Muslim because of the rules within Islam that mean they become an apostate, which means they'll be killed or their family will disown them. So I wish every Muslim had freedom yeah, from Islam. So and many of them don't understand it, which I don't blame them for. Many Muslims I talk to. How many Christians know every, every verse and every lot, part of them? Yeah, not many. No one. Yeah. But Islam, I have gone down that rabbit hole. I have looked at the life of Muhammad. I've looked at 
what he did, what he teaches, what he what his view is of the world, and it's barbaric, it's backwards, and it's not right. And I don't want it in Great Britain. So if there, if I don't want the influence it has, and simply sit by and act as a coward when you know something's wrong, is simply that is cowardice. And to Muslims, again, after Lee Rigby's beheading, no one has ever picks this, these things yet. Yeah? When Lee Rigby was beheaded, I stood and I gave a speech, and I said. There's 600 to 10,000 English Defence League supporters who are very angry. I said, there's 660 Muslims serving in the armed forces. They're doing a lot more for this country than we are. Huh? I said, so if you attack a Muslim woman walking down the street, you're a fucking arsehole. Right? You're a coward. I'd punch you in the face. If I saw a man disrespect a Muslim woman or any woman, I'd, pang, I'd punch him myself. Yeah? I said, so there's a difference between having something you honourably oppose, which I honourably oppose the Islamisation of Great Britain, and then there's a difference between being a wrong one. So our cause is righteous. We need to protect Great Britain from Islam, the spread of Islam, the dominance of Islam, Saudi, Qatar. Qatar has spent 700 billion pounds, 700, yeah, nearly a trillion pounds in radicalizing Muslims throughout Europe. Qatar, who is the home of Hamas, Qatar, who sponsor most terrorist organizations, the Muslim Brotherhood, all these groups. Qatar own the majority of our capital city. Harrod, they own everything. And our, our, our politicians just sit and say nothing because they're buying the way for our nation. Well, our, our politicians might be for sale. They might want our capital to be for sale. But the British public aren't for sale. And we're fed up. And we want, when we say we want our country back, we want it back. We want it back from the elite. We want it back from the cabal. We want it back from Islam. We want it back. We want our freedom back. We want our identity back. We want our nation back. For someone who's so patriotic, I know how much you love England. I know how much you love the United Kingdom and everything that you do. You think it's for the right reasons. But why are you so invested with Israel and Palestine? Israel, Palestine. So... Multiple, multiple reasons. Because I, people talk about you're fucking funded by the Jews uh, and Mossad and... Mate, so say, 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 for example, Baluchistan, yeah? So have you heard of Baluchistan? No. So Baluchistan was, a, it's the land, it's an area, it's, it's, it's their land before we created Pakistan. So then we created Pakistan and the Pakistani army have just took all the wealth of Baluchistan and they enslaved the Baluch people. They, anyone who talks out is kidnapped and murdered and gone, yeah? No fucker talks about Baluchistan. No, none of the Muslims talk about Baluchistan. Free in the Baluch people, yeah? It's always about Israel. There's plenty of other um, similar situations that no one talks about. It's only when it's about the Jews. So my knowledge of Islam, Mein Kampf, Hitler's book, is 7% Jew hatred. The Quran's 11%. They hate the Jews. Muhammad hated the Jews. Muhammad beheaded a, a whole tribe of Jews who surrendered, 600 of them in one day. And he raped the leader of that tribe's wife, Sophia, that night. So... This isn't about land for me. And many Muslim, the Muslims saying, or the extremists saying, or the, the terrorists saying is, Saturday first, then come Sunday. That means the Jews first, then the Christians. So if anyone who watched the, the attack on, on October 7th, the terrorist atrocity on October 7th, uh, you watched it and saw how emboldened these groups and these radicals got across the entire West. What do you think? What do you think if they overtook Israel? Yeah. If they wiped out all the Jews, which is the goal, Hamas's goal is death to every Jew, not the Zionists. Every Jew has to be killed. Yeah? That's their goal. They, that's in their manifesto. It's not my view, it's theirs. So if they'd done that, do you think they'd just stop at Israel? All the, they already told us on October 8th, we're coming for Rome, we're coming for London. Yeah? After that attack, that's what they told us. So I know Israel's in the way. I know that if Israel falls, they're coming straight through Europe. They're already in Europe. But that fight for jihad, where they all come for jihad, which is what happens, Lebanon has seen it. Iran saw it. Iran was a free country. Iran, Lebanon was the Christian jewel of fucking the Middle East. The best universities, the best freedom. No other countries would let the Muslim migrants in, but, but Lebanon did because they were Christian and forgiving. What did the Muslim migrants done? They launched a fucking jihad and they took over Lebanon and enslaved the Christians. That's what, what do you think is going to happen in Europe? And only now... Political parties on the rise across Europe are all the political parties who understand this. Nigel Farage still doesn't understand it. Nigel Farage, as soon as he got votes for reform, he sold the position of the chairman to the biggest funder, which was a Muslim. The chairman of the reform party now is a Muslim. So they're, they're, they're not going to be... You can't, can't count on reform to stop the Islamization of Great Britain because their biggest funder is a Muslim businessman. It's like, fucking hell, lads. You just sold your seat like that. Sold, sold your place like that. Now, for me, I don't want to see... Is, Islam dominate Great Britain and I'll fight to my last breath to make sure it doesn't. And, and, and when I say fight, I believe that if the public were awakened tomorrow and everyone understood what the future of our country looks like under Islam, there'd be a revolution tomorrow. We're running out of time. What do you think of Donald Trump? I love him. 
Absolutely love him. Why? Why? Because he didn't have to do what he's done. He's a billionaire. He was loved by everyone. Everyone loved him. The left loved him and the right loved him. He was the American dream. He was the American success story. But yet he put himself into a position where he's had two assassination attempts now, where he has to live the rest of his life hated by half of the country or by a lot of the people in the country, where he's tarnished as a racist, tarnished as all he... He didn't have to do any of that. He could have just carried on living his beautiful little life, playing his golf. But he put America first because he loves his country and he knows that it's been stolen and robbed. And he knows those in control, the same people who are in control of invading Iraq and invading Afghanistan, the same people who are in control of the Ukraine war, all, the, all of the death and all the war. Under Donald Trump's four, four years of leadership, no war. None. This wouldn't have happened in with Palestine and Israel. It wouldn't happen with Ukraine and Russia. It wouldn't have happened. But certain agendas controlling, which is what I talk about all in this, certain war machines, certain cabals that are controlling our governments want war. They want displacement. They need war. They want it for their own economies. So America gives six billion pounds over to Ukraine. What do Ukraine do with the six billion pounds? Give it back to America for weapons. <laughs> it just keeps the economy going. Yeah, it's just like laundering money. It's just laundering money. And, ch and, 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 and children as well, Ukraine. Ukraine has always been known. We look here and here. Ukraine, up until the war, all the media talked about Ukraine as being the most corrupt country in, in, the, in Europe and one of the most corrupt countries, you think, uh, eighth worst in the world, yeah? And child... Um, trafficking. Uh, child trafficking. So Ukraine is the top for that, top for that. And Nazis. So our media, the Guardian, all left-wing media, always just were hammering them. As soon as the war started, they're all fucking heroes. They're funding the Nazis. We're funding the Nazis. Look at it. We look here in this book with all the facts. Our government are funding neo-Nazis. Now they're not neo-Nazis. Now they're the good guys. They just fucking change it and lie for whatever agenda. Like we funded ISIS. We funded ISIS. When ISIS were fighting in Syria, we wanted ISIS to beat Assad. For our own geopolitical fucking worldview, that's what we wanted rid of Assad. Now, Putin, it wasn't about, at first it was about Crimea. Then, then listen to Zelensky, all of a sudden it changes. It's about regime change in Russia. So you want rid of Putin. What happens when you get rid of Putin? Look what happened when you got rid of Gaddafi. Do you know there's 200 different ethnicities in Russia? Now, I went, I went to Russia. I spoke to, I, I went to a massive conference against Putin. But they are terrified of what happens when Putin goes. Even the people who are against him. They said, we're concerned. He's got control of Chechnya. He's got control of the country. What happens when he's gone? It turns to a fucking war zone like Libya, like all these other countries. Right. Like, like all of them. Like all of them. So no matter what, how, if he's a tyrant, why are you getting involved? Why is it? Why have we gone against every agreement in surrounding Russia, basically? Why did we overthrow a democratically elected government in fucking Ukraine? Because they were pro-Putin. Well, they chose that for elections. And then you say, we fund a militia resistance against it. And then we say, we, we, we say we're fighting for democracy. So I just get so wound up that the 1%, which is all they give a shit about anyway, is farming us like animals and money and playing us all against each other. And every conflict. And I think Donald Trump is in that way. He's in the way, which is why they've tried to assassinate him. Anyone who looks at assassination attempt, they stood there. They stood the so They knew he was on the roof of a gun and they, st they, they stood Secret Service down. Not to shoot him. They, he, Donald Trump went like that and missed the bullet. Otherwise, he'd be dead. Then they've got total control again for decades. For decades. More war, more death. More, we get poorer, they get richer. So I think Donald Trump is... Uh, is our last hope to save Western civilization because our civilization is destroyed. We've lost identity. We're too weak to stand up for ourselves and people need fearless men. Like, as I said, Nigel Farage ain't going to shift no over and window. He, he's going to wait. Like Donald Trump's already said, the biggest deportation ever, ever come in American history is coming. You're going. Good. What do you think of the media machine? Kate Hopkins speaks about it. How the media manipulate the control and the ch can change any narrative and how they want to see someone on this planet. Yeah, so they are a tool of the totalitarian state. And that's why you see any citizen journalists, any of them holding podcasts like this or any of, this, any of the up and coming, you see these lads going out and live streaming and support them. You want to you fuck Netflix off, fuck Amazon off, yeah, and start giving these kids your money. Start supporting any of them. I'm not just saying support Urban Scoop. We do great work. We've hired Sammy Woodhouse. She is brilliant. Yeah, she's at she's, No, but she's going to go on to be a, I reckon, one of the most recognised journalists by the British public that in the whole country, in her work. She is. I, I watch her and just think, wow, she's going to be great. Get behind these people. Get behind Mayor Tusi. 
get behind all, the, all of these the Lotus Eaters, any of these different. And do you know what I used our, our massive event in London? I got them all up one by one. Do you know, I, t I felt so much satisfaction because we had a media section and the Daily Mail kept asking for, for a pass. I said, the fuck off. You're yeah, coming in. It's for the fucking, the, the, the real media. And then I got all of them up one by one and said, introduce yourself. We had a million people live and they stood up and said, my name is, and these are little people who are starting their YouTube channels, who are trying to do journalism and they're the people, that's the future. Like Elon Musk says, citizen journalism is the future. The, the, the mainstream media are the cancer and citizen journalists are the cure. And what, we, what do you think, Elon Musk? I think he's hilarious, yeah? He doesn't give a shit. And I think that, again, he doesn't have to have done what he's just done. I don't think he'll be remembered for Tesla cars. I don't think he'll be remembered for putting anything in space. He'll be remembered for saving freedom of speech. The biggest battle we have now is for free speech. And he, that, that will be his legacy. It's the battle and the fight for freedom of speech. The, what, what's gone on now in Brazil, where they took, took X down, the communists, the takeover, the oppression of the people. When they control, they need to control everything you're hearing. They have to. So anyone who comes in their way, they've got out their way like us. Yeah. But now there's a billionaire who's got the money to fight them, who's not willing to back down. And then he's going to be part of Trump's government. And then JFK's coming in. And he's going to sort out the big farmer and all the spraying the fucking bullshit in the clouds, which is all meant to be conspiracy theory. Everyone knows what they're doing. They're poisoning us left, right and centre. Mm. So there's so much happening. It's a big year. I'm just gutted that on November 5th, when Donald Trump wins that election, I'm probably sat in Belmarsh. Where do you go forward for the future with it all, Tommy? Because you say you're going to prison. You, I know you've got your rally again. Is it the 26th of October? 26th of October. Where do you go forward for the future? Just keep fighting. Keep punching back. Do you feel as if you're fighting a lost cause? Sometimes? Uh, no. Not now because of your social media back? Well, not now just because I've got social media. But do you know when I walk down the street, um, James, I don't get people saying, all right, Tommy. I get people emotionally embracing me. So I see, I see the feeling and the love and the, I see it and feel it every day. So I, and I see how far we've come in that fight. So I see that Britain's awake, man. That's what I'm saying. The revolution is brewing. That they, if they imprison me for a year now, yeah, you, you're just you, you are, um, you're just putting it back because you're not stopping us. I'm not going to stop. That's what I keep saying. You, you keep putting me in a position. Yeah, I feel down at times and I feel broken at times, but I will get back up and fight every time. And uh, I think, and uh, I think if anyone heard my mum's message when I was over, I, I, the, the holiday happened. I left the holiday. I went to Fengarola. I thought I'd try here fucking starting again and then my mum said and I was feeling sorry for myself and I went out on the piss I can't drink yeah because it takes me to a dark place yeah same thing. I fucking can't do it it takes me to real bad places mental places and then my mum sent me a voice note saying get the fucking fight fight you don't give up what are you doing you never give up because my mum's my mum's had stage 4 cancer she's been in a 12 hour operation she wasn't getting men to get through she's supposed to be dead and she just fights. And she says, I fight for you and I fight for the kids and I fight to see you and I want to live to see your kids grow up and all that. So my, that, my mum's just all day. My mum's a little four foot 11 mad paddy. And uh, she sent me that voice note and it was after listening to that voice note, I've, I thought, right, okay. Demo on the 26th of October and we're making a film to show they fucking lied. Because that's, us, that's the only way I see that I can punch back. And then I thought, I'll, I'll sit here now until both of those things are completed. We have just paid literally for the demonstration, £60,000, screens, PAs, we've got singers, we've got dancers. It doesn't matter if they put me in jail when I land at the border. <laughs> it doesn't matter because the demonstration's happening and I'll take great joy in that. For people scared to go to the demo, what advice would you have Don't for them? Don't be scared. Trust me. It's not what you expect. There is no, There will be no violence. We have control of our supporters. Um, people are angry and I said to people, if you didn't have a platform, <clears throat> I'd understand the anger. The world's going to be watching. The entire world's listening, yeah? Our voice is louder than it's ever been. Don't let yourself down. Don't let us down. Everything we're going through to make this a success, if you turn up and get aggressive and violent, you've undone everything. So if you can't control your anger, don't come. And, and that's not me being horrible because I was, I, I was that young, angry man when I was in my early 20s as well. But that's what they want. <clears throat> so even if they provoke you, even if, if I turned up on that 26th of October and a police officer hits me around the legs with a bat and I'm not reacting, I'll smile because I want to win. And we're in a fight. And our fight is to win the hearts and minds of the world and win the hearts and minds of the British public and really turn opinion against these fuckers who are controlling everything. And, and it's turning. Just before we finish up, Tommy, if you were Prime Minister or President, what five things would you change to try and make the world a better place? Well, I'd stop. I'll, I'll tell, do you know what? Because we've, 
I, I believe there's been success stories for immigration, but I would stop total immigration into the UK. We'll just stop it now. Okay, enough's enough. We, we need to look at the demographical change to this country and what it faces. I would stop all Qatari money, all, this, all, all Iranian money. Anyone on the terror watch list from the Islamic community would be gone tomorrow, straight away. We're at war, whether we like it or not. We may have foiled how many attacks, 75, they, they give the figures the other day on the tax. Well, I'd, I'd intern them terrorists because I'm not waiting for them to kill British public anymore. The first and foremost government job of the British government is to protect British citizens. Not Afghanis, not Iraqis, not Syrians, not fucking Somalis, British citizens whose fathers and bloodlines have bled for this nation. They come first. They come first in every essence. It's not racist. That's common sense. The fact that even saying that now is seen as extreme. It's insane, man. And I would make sure that freedom of speech is absolutely protected, especially in universities. I'd tackle the fact of the indoctrination in the universities and the education system. Get rid of all this transgender bullshit. You are facilitating the destruction of a generation of children who half of them are self-harming, half of them are autistic, half of them want to chop their dicks off and tits off. It's insanity. Total fucking insanity. Teachers are entertaining it. Education systems are entertaining it. But they're doing it on purpose. So I would go to town, which is what we need. It's total go to town with total common sense. We need to go back where we were. Not all this insane woke bullshit. I know you've had your own struggles, Tommy, to try and overcome them and kick on. For anybody watching, it's an a life of struggle right now. What advice would you have for them? Uh, get out and walk. Get out, start off walking. You see... I know if I go three, four days, I can start spiraling, man. If I if I maintain fitness and health, one hour a day, and you think it's hard, but everyone can commit to one hour a day. I say to that's what I said to my son, brother, Irene, are you training? Yeah, I train, Dad. You feeling good? Yeah. You feel better. It's the it's the natural medicine for all of. I wouldn't. I'd say I I wouldn't take any pharmaceutical drugs, any antidepressants or bullshit like that. Go for a run. You go for a run, five days, six days, seven days, for, for two, three weeks, you will, you'll stop feeling depressed. You'll start feeling better. All natural, everything natural. That's mine. That's what I'd say. But that's me looking at my life. I know now, I wish, it took me till I was 39, 38, to realise I need the gym. I need. Mm. And I, I, don't, I don't want to go to the gym. I need the gym. I need to train in the morning. I need to be healthy. And if I'm not, everything spirals. But the, the other advice I give is go to trmanifesto.com. Buy my book and uh, yeah, get to get yourself to London 26th of October and don't be don't be afraid to speak because that bubble is burst. The bubble's burst. They know it's burst as well. <coughs> they know it's burst. Tommy, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, just thanks, James. I've watched you for years, bruv. Um, yeah, you've done very well. I remember when you yeah. first started. Yeah. So it's great. I, I love watching progression stories. So when I look at someone and I see them, and some people stay the part and some people don't stay the part. And I see people come and go, but you've always there. So well done. Appreciate that. Listen, everything you do, you know I've got nothing but respect for you. I wish you all the best Cheers. when you come back and land in the UK. Hope the 26 goes great. And anybody listen, like I say, don't be scared. Just listen to other people's stories. Watch the documentaries. Have your own opinion. I know you've got so much love and support. And I know people are scared to talk to you. Some people maybe think you're the devil or the mad racist. But just look at the bigger picture. I question everything. But like I say, I wish you all the best for the future, Tommy. And God bless me, and uh, you, see you soon, brother. Thank you, man. Take care. Cheers.